Good evening. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. Tonight is Monday, May 24th, and I am calling this meeting to order. One second to get my stuff up. Okay, here we go. Orange County Schools Board of Education pledges to our family, students, staff, and the greater community to conduct our business in a courteous and productive manner, showing respect for fellow board members, staff, and citizens. The board asks its citizens to conduct themselves with the same courtesy towards all staff members and each other. As for board policy, Robert's rules of order will be used to conduct meetings and a moment of silence will be observed before we begin our business. Public comment will be held tonight after the presentation of each agenda item for which there is a speaker signed up. As of right now, I don't believe anyone has signed up to speak, but we will check on that throughout the meeting. Um, tonight, I ask that we remember that OCS educates our students on the traditional land of the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation, and that we continue to grow as an organization who values authentic connections and repairs harms with the indigenous people of these lands. We will now have a moment of silence. Thank you so much. And with that, I will pass it over to you, Dr. Felder for our recognitions this evening. Why, good Why, evening good and thank you. Thank you, Chair McKenzie, Vice Chair Stevens, uh, to the entire board, our students, staff, and families. Indeed, uh, tonight we have a couple of recognitions. Next slide, please. And so um, the first, Recognition is one that uh, we shared at our last uh, board meeting, uh, but can't emphasize enough. So we recognize and emphasize that May is Mental Health Awareness Month. Mental Health Awareness Month, also referred to as Mental Health Month, has been observed in May in the United States since 1949. That's a very long time. Um, we are once again wearing green uh, to show our support of and raise awareness of trauma and the impact it can have on the physical, emotional, and mental well-being of children, families, and communities. Each year, millions of Americans face the reality of living with a mental illness. Uh, so just as this slide states, uh, you really can't tell uh, by looking at someone what they're going through. Uh, so as a district, we have to help fight the stigma, provide support, educate the public and advocate for policies that support people with mental illness and their families. Uh, information and resources can be found on the district's website. The employee assistance program exists and as well as other resources for our staff uh, and they can be accessed through the human resources department and students and families can contact their school's counselor or social worker for more information and support. Thank you. So the next recognition, if we could change slides, our second and final recognition uh, for tonight would be uh, this month's Equity Warrior. So you should all know the answer to this question by now. What is an Equity Warrior? Well, an Equity Warrior is someone who is driven by personal values and beliefs. Uh, they are passionate about and contribute freely to equity work beyond their assigned role. Uh, they are also willing to grow and learn to become more effective in advancing the equity agenda in their school, uh, their district, or the community, and or the community. So tonight we want to recognize one such equity warrior in our district. And so right now I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Dina Keeling, Chief Equity Officer, to introduce May's Equity Warrior. Dr. Keeling. Good evening, everyone. I often brag that Mr. Hunt was my first hire. Now, the reality is that I don't hire anyone. I just served on his interview committee, but he immediately stood out to me because when I asked him questions about leading with equity, he didn't respond as though he was answering interview questions. Instead, his responses told me that he didn't just lead equity, he lived equity. Because of Mr. Hunt's leadership, the students of Orange High have an expectation that their voices will be heard. The students and staff have an expectation that the disparities in their buildings will be addressed. They have an expectation that the voices and experiences 
of those students who are closest to those disparities are the driving force for decisions. They will not accept a school culture that does anything less than empowers those who was once silenced, that leans into those who were once excluded, and that lifts up those who used to be pushed to the margins. And that is the evidence of a true equity warrior and leader, the imprint that remains when that person is gone. If you want to know about someone's leadership, ask those who they lead. But if you really want to know, ask them when they have nothing to lose or gain by what they say. And so here's a quote from one of the students that goes to Orange High. Here's what she had to say about Mr. Hunt. This is Savannah Clay. For the first time in years, I felt like my principal, principal genuinely cared about what I had to say and was just as passionate as I was about improving equity in our school and beyond. Mr. Hunt wasn't an unapproachable adult figure that I thought didn't even know of my existence. Instead, Mr. Hunt was always but a phone call or email away and took the time out to build personal relationships with as many students as possible for the short amount of time he's been here. In the four years I've attended Orange High School, Mr. Hunt was hands down the best principal I've had the privilege of meeting. He is without a doubt a man of his word and a man of action. When the equity team, other students of color, and students from other marginalized groups expressed their concerns, Mr. Hunt took the steps necessary to address and prevent those problems from arising again. He is the type of person we need more of in this world. A person who leads, listens, strives for improvement, and steps up when others idly stand by. Mr. Hunt is well deserving of the title equity warrior, and I'm surprised he hasn't been bestowed this honor sooner. Overall, Mr. Hunt is an amazing person and an even more amazing principal. To read the full Equity Warrior feature story with more student and staff perspectives, it is posted on our website or will be posted in the coming days. Congratulations, Mr. Hunt, for being this month's Equity Warrior. We appreciate you and will miss you tremendously as you move on to your next challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Feeling. So now I will see, do we have a motion to adopt tonight's agenda? So moved. Motion from Ms. Smiley, is there a second? From Ms. Moore, Ms. Hatler, do you have a comment? Are you speaking? I can't hear you. Um, is it possible that the owl is muted? It is muted. Bear with us, everyone. Just one second. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. I wanted. I That's wanted okay. to pull something. I wanted to pull something from the consent agenda. Is that? Um, is this a time? Well. No, that's it. When we actually get to the consent agenda in just a moment, because the. the Consent agenda, approving the consent agenda is just an item on the agenda. If that makes sense. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to call the vote now. Um, Ms. Stevens? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Mr. Atherson? Yes. Yes. Ms. Hauser? Yes. I vote yes. Ms. Moore? Yes. Ms. Smiley? Yes. Our agenda is approved. So now we have the consent agenda and I'm going to walk through the requests that I have received so far and make sure that I have captured everything and then we'll approve um, the bulk of it and then we'll go through items that are pulled. So I'm going to pull the minutes because I wasn't at the last meeting and I can't vote on them. So um, that's the first thing we'll put um after the block i have heard uh we're gonna vote on a revised personnel report which is just a note and i have heard that we would like to pull phase one 
and the central update. Is that what you were hoping to pull, Ms. Hauser? Okay. And um, pulling policy 5027 slash 7275 from backlog policies. Is that right? Okay. So those four things will come after we vote on this first block of the main thing. So with that, I'll take a motion to approve the first block. So moved, Madam Chair. I have a motion from Ms. Sanders. Second from Ms. Kelly, just to make sure we're clear, we're voting on a robot personnel report here. Uh, Mr. Atherton. Uh, no. Ms. No? No. Do, do you want us to pull anything else to discuss? Okay, Ms. Doyle. Yes. Ms. Hauser. Yes. I vote yes. Ms. Moore. Yes. Ms. Smiley. Yes. Ms. Stevens. Yes. Okay, then um, the consent agenda has been approved. Um, we will move on to the meeting minutes from May 10th, which the only reason I pulled is because I wasn't there and didn't want to vote on them. Do I have a motion to approve? Moved. A motion from Mr. Atherton. Is there a second? Second. Second. Smiley. Second from Ms. Smiley. Ms. Stevens? Yes. Mr. Atherton? Yes. Ms. Doyle? Yes. Ms. Hauser? Yes. Ms. Moore. Yes. Minutes are approved. Um, the next item to vote on is phase one central elementary school electrical upgrade. Ms. Hauser, would you like to um, ask questions or have a conversation? Yes, please. I, I just have some conversations about the project. I understand that we've had trouble um, getting vendors to bid on the entire project. And I'd like to know first what we've done about approaching larger companies, like, for example, companies like Johnson Controls to um, bid the entirety of our HVAC project. So that's one question. And then uh, to see if we can get around this resource problem. But then I wanted to know how splitting the project affects the overall timing and budget of the project. So if we split it into pieces. Will it end up costing more? And then how much time do we actually save versus just leaving the project intact? Um, the, the documents say that this is an informal bid. And just because I'm new to the board, I'd like to know what an informal bid is um, and how many companies have actually responded to this. Um, and third, um, does we're bringing a new um, head of operations on soon, and I wondered if the board sh should wait to see if um, to let him take over. These are all bond projects, so I wonder they we've been waiting years for them to move forward, and I just wonder if we shouldn't wait another month or so for a new chief operating officer to come on up and take take move these things together. So those are my questions. I don't know who to who should answer them. Thank you, Ms. Hauser. Um, good evening, um, Chairman McKenzie and Vice Chair Stevens, board members, Dr. Felder. Um, I'm going to also ask that, um, I'm sorry, I can turn down my volume a little bit, ask um, my colleague from operations, Mr. Nick Mincy, to jump on board to assist with some of the answers, as well as Ms. Rath, our um, CFO, to help with um, some of the answers, but in general, if I could address uh, your three concerns, Ms. Hauser, that you raised, I just want to reiterate, and I'm going to just start in a little bit, the second item that you posed versus um, the first, because I think it, it makes a difference. Please know that we did originally put out an, um, the RFP for the complete HVAC upgrade um, project for Central Elementary School. 
and um, this is was previously shared as previously shared in a board update. We actually um, did put it out an RFP. We actually had a, a number of, of um, general contractors, electricians, um, HVAC um, companies uh, respond to the bid. I think I want to say we had about 12, so it wasn't a lack of response to our proposal. What posed the challenge was that um, the equipment that we needed to start the project was back ordered, and we would not be getting the equipment that we needed to allow us to start the project this summer. And so when we were taking a look at what the different options were and the timeline, what it was looking like was that we would have to wait another whole year before we could start the project um, if we proceeded as originally planned. And so we went back to the drawing board to see were there other options for, that would allow us to keep the project moving forward and not put a halt for another year. And that's when we um, came up with the, um, the, the option to take out um, a part of the electrical work. And so the original RFP was a, an RFP with a formal bid. A formal bid is just that, that it re requires a write-up of the request for proposal, explaining in detail what is what it is that we are expecting from the bidders, the full scope of work, and then, you know, there's the whole opening of the bid after the submission, and that's a formal process for a formal bid. So we did go forward with that. The informal bid is what we um, ended up doing with this smaller phase one of the electrical upgrade, because by doing this smaller piece, what it would allow us to do is get the project started. And once the rest of the equipment came in, it would allow us to start the work and the plan would be that we would have to start uh, winter holiday because school would be closed and would allow us that time without the children and staff in the building to start the work. And then when it would come to us needing to do this electrical work that we're pulling out this summer, we wouldn't have to shut down, shut down power and do this electrical work before we can continue with the HVAC um, upgrade. And so that was one of the reasons why we decided to pull this portion out, do it now while we can, and then winter holiday, start the full HVAC um, project. And then the plan would be to work to be done by the start of school in August. So timeline, you know, it's about the same timeline as originally planned. It would allow us um, it was a minimal additional cost for that we would just reallocate within our budgets. So we would not be asking for any additional funding for that. And that was um, about $20,000 that we needed to draw up the new plans and the designs for this smaller um, part of the project. So the informal bid for services under these types of um, service contracts, it goes up to $500,000 before we need to do a formal bid. In an informal bid, we put out the, the um, scope of work that is needed, and then we get quotes and submissions from um, companies that are looking to do the work. And it's not a full, put another RFP out, get another um, formal process. Uh, so that's part of where the formal and informal differentiates. In regards to, you know, taking a look at a larger firm, it's instead of saying, you know, what we did was we looked at what it is that we're doing, the way that everything has been planned, has been allocated dollars for, and it, it, we didn't see the feasibility of hiring a larger firm. Uh, part in part, a couple things, right? The allocation of our funds are, are such that we don't get all of the lump sum up front, it's um, se separated out into multiple years. Yes, we could go back to the commissioners and ask them to um, provide the funding for us different than, than what it's scheduled, and it is doable, but that also means that we have to go back to our drawing board just as they would 
And we would have to figure if we're asking for these funds now up front, what other projects and funding are we going to put on back burner and provide that funding back? Because, and this is where I'm going to ask, you know, uh, Ms. Rath to provide a little more detail because of the debt interest rate and a certain percentage that we have to maintain. We can't just ask for the money up front, get it, and then it's just as clean like that. We actually have to provide that money back from something else. Um, so that was one of the reasons. Another reason, um, you know, to have multiple projects going on all at the same time on top of the projects that we currently have every year that's going on. We just don't have the staff to maintain all of that. And then the other piece of it too that is out of our control is the availability of the equipment. Um, you know, that's part of the reason why even just trying to do one project, we were held back because of the equipment not being available to us on our timeline. So those are some of the reasons that we didn't go with the larger firm, but what we did do is work with our engineer whom we do have a contract with to expedite and to move up some of our larger projects. I mean, our HVAC projects. So um, yes, we have Central that's slotted to start uh, it, one portion of it this summer and then the full project and winter holiday. Ethylene Cheeks and ALS, we have moved up and we are expediting and going at that at a faster timeline than we initially um, proposed. And so Eflin, that work will be starting next summer. So we've already started working on the uh, designs and the plans, plans for Eflin Cheeks and ALS. So in regards to, you know, do we wait for our new COO to start? Waiting and waiting another, even if it's a month, that definitely will slow down our timeline because to wait another month, we can't do the electrical work without disrupting teaching and learning, waiting another month. Um, that's why we have, we're on the timeline that we are to try to get as much work done and complete this portion before our students return to school. So, you know, in, in keeping with the timeline of trying to finish Central by the end of um, or by August for the start of school the following summer, uh, we recommend that we continue with this timeline instead of waiting for a new COO. So, Ms. Rath, if you wanted to add anything to that, Mr. Mincy, if there's anything I missed, I tried to explain it in layman's terms as best as possible. Number one, because, you know, I'm not that technical person to provide technical terminology, but um, in layman's terms, I tried to explain that as best as um, I can so that we can understand it. Um, but I know Mr. Mincy and Ms. Rapp, they're, they're the experts in their field, so they're welcome to add. If I could just play back, first of all, thank you. And I like the layman stuff because it, it's understandable for me um, that by doing the electrical work now that when it comes time, when the equipment comes available, the swap in of the equipment will happen a lot faster. So I get that. So that makes a lot of sense. I really appreciate that. Um, I think we probably need to have a longer discussion about the money. As far as I understand, the county budget has the bond money. This is the last installment of the bond money. It's in the budget. It's in the budget this year. And as fast as we can spend it is as fast as we can get those HVAC systems in. So I, um, we could take it offline. I'd love to. So I'd say let's go ahead with this. It makes sense, but I bet we could move faster on it. We, we should explore options to move faster on those other projects. As I see it, the money's there. You know, you, the, this, this money was approved by the voters in 2016. It is now 2021. And we're looking at 2023 or four to have these projects finished. And it, um, it, it rocks me to my core. That's all. It just rocks me to my core. But thank you. That was perfect. I appreciate it. So I, I'd like to go ahead and move that we go ahead with this, with the electrical project as proposed. Second. I have a motion for Ms. Hauser and a second for Mr. Atherton. Uh, Ms. Doyle? Yes. Ms. Hauser. I vote yes. Ms. Moore. Yes. Ms. Smiley. Yes. 
Ms. Stevens? Yes. And Mr. Atherton? Yes. Phase one central elementary school electrical upgrade has been approved. The next item from consent for discussion is policy 5027 slash 7275. Mr. Atherton? So I'd like to make a motion to approve policy uh, 5027 slash 7257 with the change to section C exclusion 1A to read by the superintendent or designee at the end of the sentence. I have a motion for Mr. Atherton. Is there a second? A second. I have a second for Ms. Moore. Ms. Smiley? Yes. Ms. Stevens? Yes. Mr. Atherton? Yes. Ms. Doyle? Yes. Ms. Hauser? Yes. I vote yes. Ms. Moore? Yes. Policy has been approved. Thank you, everyone. We have completed our consent agenda. Um, the next item is a board discussion um, from, it's kind of a spillover from our community engagement committee. We just wanted to engage as a full board. And I'm going to turn it over to the chair of our community engagement committee, Ms. Carrie Doyle, to lead us through this. Thank you, Chair McKenzie. Am I glitchy sounding? So I can turn off my video. No, okay, great. Um, it's been a real privilege to lead our community engagement um, committee. I, I truly love that work. Um, so as this school year comes to a close and we look ahead towards summer and the 21-22 school year, um, we were only able to have a brief conversation um, in our uh, recent community engagement meeting. Um, how do we as a board feel we can most effectively engage with the OCS community in a coordinated way? And so, um, there are three venues for us to consider um, or have a little discussion around. We don't have to make a decision tonight, but um, so the first one is virtual office hours. We started uh, monthly virtual office hours with a rotation of two board members per month in January of this year. Um, we have offered translation services. Um, we've had folks regularly show up at the office hours. Um, so we could consider that these have been helpful um, and to continue going forward. Um, for people either with child care needs or health concerns that make in person opportunities more difficult for them. However, we did not necessarily uh, hear from a diverse cross section of the community. I don't think we ever used our translation services because no one requested them. And so the question is, how do we feel about continuing these monthly office hours into next year? So that's the first of three. Does anyone have um, thoughts about that? Do you, do you want me to do it this way, Hillary, to just do one at a time, or do you rather I put all three out there? Maybe you should just put all three out there, and then we can just go around and comment. Okay, that I mean, sounds I don't, great. I'm not tied to that's it, fine. but that's... That's fine, because I know that we have a, a reasonably full agenda, so we might not be able to... We'll have to follow up on some of this later, but just to put this all out there, maybe get some feedback from the public, too. The second option that we've talked about a couple of times in community engagement is something like a Google top doc um, type of calendar of events for board members. So as board members, we often get emails or hear about different things such as um, yard work days at schools or cultural events um, at local galleries or different things that we hear about. And if we had a calendar that could be maintained for board members, it may help us ensure that a couple or a few of us are making it out to different events across the district. Um, it could be that principals as well could email in events uh, where board members would be welcome to come and watch or listen to students. So that's another tool. I'm curious if people um, think would be helpful and whether or not it'd be problematic for staff to maintain. I got a little feedback from Dr. Felder that um, she didn't think that would be a problem. She liked the idea. And then the third idea was sort of how we had the rotation of um, virtual office hours to have a rotation of board members taking the lead on um, listening opportunities, um, possibly on a monthly base, basis this coming year. Um, so this would be in person, particularly in parts of the community where we don't hear from people regularly. Um, so perhaps two members a month or something could select or identify a place in the community where it'd be helpful for us to go visit in person, make ourselves available for listening community members. Um, these events could be at community centers, places of worship, um, housing, 
sites, athletic events, the idea would be to get us out in parts of the district where we hear from people less. And so maybe, um, yeah, maybe we'll, if we can just go around and people can weigh in, but we'll try to keep it a little bit brief too. Does anyone want to start? Well, I'll just start because so, we've got to we've got to do this. <clears throat> I think I've, I've shared this with a couple of uh, board members. I like what we've been doing. First of all, I like the, the the Google Calendar, letting board members know what's going on because I didn't know about the uh, when you all were uh, cleaning up <laughs> at a school uh, until I saw you on the social media. You know. I, I would have I would have joined you. So uh, that's a good idea. Uh, the virtual office hours was a good idea, but it's fine for a certain segment of our community because it did not have uh, diverse voices from what I hear. And I think we need to try to uh, uh, have a platform where we can have a more diverse. Because you know we say, you know, we're checking these boxes and we're saying that everything is. Uh, you know, equitable or diverse or whatever, but it is not. So I think we need to try to come up with a way to include more, uh, more diverse, have a more diverse community. Uh, because I touched upon it, I was gonna, I was supposed to be meeting with Bonnie Hauser this month, but we realized uh, Memorial Day is coming up. But I, I have a, a wonderful idea that she and I will probably work on together because I believe we need to include. Uh, more of our community. But thank you all. Thank you, Carrie, for doing that. Thanks, Brenda. Bonnie? Yeah. I, um, there's help. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, I think the office hours have been terrific. Um, but as you point out, that we are not reaching who we need to reach. And when we first started them, they were really responsive to issues that were happening in the in the community. To, to me, the number one rule on the office hours is the community needs to lead. Not, not shouldn't be at our convenience, it should be at their convenience. And again, if you point out, it'd be great if we could do them in person. I think we did one in person last year. So I wonder if we could just put something on our website that says the board is available to meet with you at any time um, and also get that message out to our principals that they'd like some board members to show up at their schools to get it out to our community partners, the churches, the community centers, and just say, you know, invite us. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to meet with you. We're here for you. So I just wonder if there's a way we can open up the channel and let them, and then maybe do a couple of things to poke it to make to see make sure people use it. But I I love the community to lead on this. Thanks, Bonnie. Anyone Sarah? else? Um, I I like that idea very much, and the idea of poking and maybe like um sort of seeding a couple of those opportunities. Maybe there's a couple of community organizations we specifically want to reach out to and, um, you know, or churches or something to like kind of get it started. Um, um, the Google Doc calendar of events is sort of an internal tool just so we know about those opportunities, I, sound, I think sounds great. Um, yeah, and that rotation of in-person opportunities, um, I think, yeah, I, I like the idea of us working as a coordinated group to make these things happen um, in a broader way um, and not be duplicative or anything like that. So I think the, if we um, can find some way to um, do this as sort of a collective effort, um, I like the idea of that. And maybe that, sorry, just to one more thing, maybe the office hours, maybe that's just sort of a chair office out, you know, maybe, maybe there's a sort of a smaller way to do it, a small standing, something like that. I don't know. Um, Cause I think there's probably some value to it, but. Do you mean the virtual ones? Yeah, you okay. know, there, there's a convenience to that, but like, like um, Ms. Stevens was saying, it was not a diverse cross section of people. So having some opportunity for that could be good, but, but I like leaning on the in person more.
Carrie, I don't know if you're calling or I'm calling. I'm good either way, but. Yeah, you can go ahead, Hillary. I can't see everyone, so. Okay, <laughs> you okay, then I'll figure. <laughs> okay, yeah, Will and Jennifer. So, um, oh, I'm sorry, Will, go ahead. Jennifer, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I think these are very good ideas, especially the um, in person session. Um, I've spoken to Dr. Sue Florence um, a couple of times and she's um, made the community center, Cedar Grove um, Community Center um, open once um, open numbers, that type of thing um, decreases. But she definitely wants um, us to reach out and do some in person things. Thank you. Great. So, um, I do like the in person as well. Um, you know, we talked about this in the community engagement committee. Um, I, I agree with um, uh, Sarah that I think office hours does have a place for some convenience, but I, I don't think we should focus on that because we were seeing a very limited cross section. So, I do like the rotation and I do like the Google Docs because. I think we all get random invitations or we're out in public and somebody says, hey, can you go to this thing on this date? And there was a easier way for us to have access or just knowledge of it. I think it would help all of us. Um, so I think that that leaves me. Um, I, I think we're all pretty much on the same page. I love the Google Doc idea and I can talk to Tia maybe about um, how we get that set up and who has access to it and um, how we want it to function. But I think all of that is stuff that we can kind of do via email. Um, I, I think office hours have been great this year and were really important in the time of COVID. But I think going back to um, focusing on in-person meetings probably um, serves the community better. I think doing it in a coordinated way where we're alternating and going in pairs or groups of three is a great way for us to get out and talk to people. And then of course, board members can always meet with folks whenever they want, because pre COVID, I know that all of us were meeting with people all the time. So um, that's kind of my two cents on it. Um, so I, I think that this gives us some good, a good starting place and a good idea of how we want to move forward. Um, it sounds like um, Ms. Stevens and Ms. Hauser are going to work together for June to try to do something. And um, I don't I don't know anything about that, so I don't know <laughs> um, what y'all are up to, but excited to hear about it later. And then um, maybe we can start some more coordinated in-person meetings um, as the school year starts up in August. Does that sound right to everyone? Okay, and I will work with Tia to start that Google Doc and um, we'll just be in touch about it. Is there anything else that we need to discuss? Mr. Atherton and then Ms. Hauser? Yeah, the only other thing I was going to say, Hillary, is it, it may be easier if, uh, if it wasn't Google Docs or maybe an actual calendar. So wh whatever form it's okay. in, it, it may be easier to visually see the stuff, but whichever works. No, better. I think you're right. I think that's right. Um, we'll work on it. <laughs> and and I, I don't know. Like, I just like to maybe add the idea that I have this vision that we'll be meeting in person someday. And imagine if we could occasionally have board meetings in community. So as Jennifer was talking about, the Cedar Grove Center would be a great place to have a board meeting. So just occasionally just move the meeting around into occasionally a school or a community space that would be pretty interesting too well i definitely think it's something we can talk about and we can figure out how portable our recording equipment is and all that but um certainly open to it uh, any other thoughts before we move to the next item Okay, well, Ms. Doyle, thank you so much for leading the community engagement committee this year. You have done us proud and we appreciate your service. And um, I think some good things have come out of that committee this year. All right, well, the next thing on our agenda is student fees and I will turn it over to Dr. Felder. All right, thank you, Chair McKenzie. And I'm going to turn things over to Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Dr. Felder. 
Good evening, Board Chair McKenzie, Vice Chair Stevens, Board Members, Superintendent Dr. Felder, and the larger Orange County community. The purpose of this agenda item is to seek approval from the board for the proposed student fees for the 2021-2022 school year. In your board abstract, you have the proposed fees for the upcoming school year. The proposed fees for the 2021-2022 school year are the same ones that were presented to the board for approval for this, for this current school year, with the exception of fees for the after-school program. This year, the School Community Relations Department, Orange County Schools, and the board has been very accommodating with reducing the amount of full-time staff and allowing staff children to attend for free and allowing free or reduced lunch students to attend at a dis discounted rate our after-school program. This year, there were 65 students of employees that attended after school care during COVID this past year for free. Orange County Schools Administration is thankful to the Board of Education's forethought and assistance in making this happen for our staff during the pandemic. Under normal operating expenses, this would equate to approximately $164,000 for the year. In addition, there were 43 students' families who paid a reduced rate and that equates to approximately $69,000 under normal operating expenses. We can only assume that that number will increase given the fact that this year we had only 204 students in after school and the year before COVID, we had approximately over 400 students. We are recommending that we revert back to our pre-COVID fee schedule and reinstate our employee discount of 30% on after school care. This is being done to ensure that we can maintain and cover all after school care ex operating expenses. While we strongly recognize that this is not a for profit operation, Orange County Schools and SER anticipate expenses that will help with instructional support for this upcoming school year. In terms of other districts, Roxborough does not offer an employee discount. ABSS Alamance Burlington offered a discount, but will not be offering one this upcoming school year. Durham is currently offering a 15% discount to staff members, while Chap Chapel Hill is offering approximately a 30% discount. Also, the districts that were just mentioned, Durham is the only district that offers a discount for free reduced lunch families, and that rate is 15%. Just to quickly recap, the registration fee that we're recommending for this upcoming school year is $20. We're recommending a full price of $56 per week. We're, rep we're recommending um, for a family rate of $56 for the first child and $40 for each additional child. And we're recommending that the Orange County Schools employee rate will be $39. At this time, I will pause here for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Ms. Miley, then Ms. Doyle. Um, so, Mr. Johnson, can you just remind me? Um, in, so, in past years, we did not have a discounted rate for free and reduced price lunch. That's correct. And so we're reverting to that as well. Okay. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Mine's a little bit similar. So uh, I know this is different from the supervised. Okay. Um, I know we had the supervised learners. We also made an exception for no kids, um, SF students. And just wondering with those families, is there anyone that's a Sarah, you're really hard to hear. You're breaking up. Okay, Sarah. Ms. Doyle. I think Ms. Doyle was asking if there was going to be any discount for McKinney Vento or SS students. So yes, those those students would have DSS subsidies. Ms. Doyle, does that, I'm afraid I did not cover the scope of your question. Did you look through another part to it? You were really hard to hear. That's all, thank you. Okay. Okay, very good. Ms. Hauser? Yeah, I don't have a problem with the fees, um, but, um, but, but I've always had a problem with equity with our after school because 
um, there's no transportation home from it. So sometimes kids go home after school because they, the bus is the only way they get home. So I wondered if we could look at that. Um, you know, and the other question is, are we, especially if we're looking at bringing academics, if we decide to bring academics into after school, are we just looking at bringing academics into after school and tutoring them into after school? And will we want more kids to participate? And will we need to then create structures to encourage that? So not for tonight, but I think it's a conversation we should have. Thank you, Ms. Hauser. So maybe we can get sort of a, an update on the strategy for after school um, sometime in the near future. But um, I think that I will, unless anyone has any other pressing issues, I will ask if there's a motion to approve the fees for this year. Motion to approve the recommendation. Second. I have a motion from Ms. Stevens and a second from Ms. Moore. Mr. Anderson? So uh, I just have one clarity question. We are approving the whole rate sheet included, not just the after school, correct? There's a rate sheet that was attached that included band fees, t-shirts. So I want to make sure what we're approving. I would it's imagine. The, I was, okay. Yeah, right. I, yeah, I was about to say, I made the recommendation on his, um, Jason, Mr. Johnson's full recommendation. Okay, so we're approving the rate sheet plus that. Okay, yes. Ms. Doyle. Is that a yes? yes? Okay. Ms. Hauser? Yes. I vote yes. Ms. Moore? Yes. Ms. Smiley? Yes. Ms. Stevens? Yes. Our student fees are unanimously approved. We will move right along to masking and face coverings. Good evening, board chair, vice chair, board members, superintendent, and community. Um, I'm Sharita Cobb, and I'll be presenting tonight on masking and face covering. Um, on May 14th, 2021, the governor's executive order number 215 lifted the capacity restrictions, social distancing requirements, and the general face covering requirements became effective. Because children are still not vaccinated and can still spread COVID-19, face coverings are still required and nothing in the order changes the Strong Schools North Carolina toolkit requirement for face coverings in schools. So Orange County Schools will continue to monitor the governor's orders as they should be coming out with additional guidance around June 1st. Orange County Schools summer scholars will continue to follow the Strong Schools North Carolina toolkit requirements for face coverings in schools. The Orange County Health Department is supportive of this plan. And as the slide states, all schools in Plan A and Plan B will continue to use the mask. Indoor athletics, student athletes are still required to wear face coverings while competing, and all spectators are still required to wear face coverings. Indoor and outdoor instruction and recess. Face coverings must continue to be worn at all times, including indoor and outdoor instructional classes, unless a pre-approved medical exemption is in place and when students and staff are actively eating and or drinking. Indoor and outdoor recesses, unless a pre-approved medical exemption is in place. Next slide, please. In the meantime, Orange County Schools will be adhering to the current graduation plans, which include, and I'll get, let me go back, I'm sorry, outdoor athletic events. Student athletes are strongly encouraged to continue wearing coverings while competing, and as supported by the North Carolina High School Athletic Association, are required to do so when social distancing at six feet or more is not possible, such as in dugouts or on sidelines. Spectators will be allowed to remove face coverings once they are through the gate and seated. It is strongly recommended that spectators remain masked if less than six feet apart. As far as our graduation is concerned, we will be adhering to the graduation plans, which include limiting capacity, 
maintaining physical distancing, and strongly encouraging masking. The Orange County Health Department is supportive of this plan. Per the Strong School Toolkit and in collaboration with Orange County Health Department, effective June 1st, attestation and screening procedures will no longer be required if approved tonight for students and staff in Orange County schools. Students and staff will still be encouraged to conduct their attestation procedures before leaving home. Are there questions? Ms. Miley? Sorry, Ms. Cobb, can you say that last bit again? about the screening changes? Uh, we are recommending that effective June 1st, attestation and screening procedures will no longer be required for students and staff in Orange County schools, and then students and staff are still encouraged to conduct those attestation procedures before leaving home. Did they take that requirement out of the Strong Schools school kit? I, th I thought that was still in there, a requirement to do screenings. No, that's, I, that's been Say again, I'm sorry. That, that is no longer required. Correct. And the Orange County Health Department is in, we are in alignment with them with that recommendation as well. Mr. Atherton? Yeah, um, so I find it strange that for the app, outdoor athletics, which we were told by the ABCs is the number one way to catch COVID, that we're not going to require a mask. But when our kids are outside at recess, they must wear them, where it's a lot less. This seems strange to me. It seems like we would have the same kind of requirement. If kids are outside and they're socially distanced, they could take off their mask or whichever, um, but in athletics, we don't require it. And if you're playing baseball, soccer, whatever, you will be less than six feet when people, uh, when you're playing. So I, I'm just curious to hear the ABC difference on this. So I can't um, speak to the ABC, um, but I can say that the North Carolina High School Athletic Association, we are following their recommendations when it comes to the athletic piece and uh, masking and not masking during athletic events. Um, so, thank you, Ms. Cobb, and I, I appreciate that and you are spot on. Um, so we did consult with the ABC Science uh, Collaborative and um, uh, this recommendation uh, is supported by them uh, and is in alignment with our uh, sister district, uh, Chapel Carborough City Schools. Um, uh, per my conversation with uh, Dr. Benjamin, um, with regards to recess, the difficulty there is um, the social distancing aspect. And uh, hence the um, recommendation that we continue at recess uh, to. Uh, uh, requires students to uh, wear a mask. And um, and so uh, with regards to outdoor athletic events, as it states here, um, they are required to wear a mask when uh, socially distanced at six feet or more is not possible. So do we know, um, I, I know uh, Ms. Cobbs, you had mentioned that since the younger kids haven't had vaccines. Do we know that, is that a prereq for requiring or not requiring mask at recesses anymore? Because I, we, I don't know how we'd ever know that kids are vaccinated or not. I, I'm just curious. I, I know most of us probably get this question about what are what are our thoughts on mask long term, and you know what are some of the things that we would consider to allow students to not have a mask outside? And I, I'm just trying to get an idea of, you know, uh, ABC's view or others. Uh, do we have any line of sight of what what would be a recommendation for that? Is it vaccines? Well, if we were vaccinating that age group, at least the families who wanted to have their children vaccinated would have that option. Because if your child is vaccinated, 
playing outside is extremely low risk. And I mean, it, it might be low risk even for kids who aren't vaccinated, but if they can't social distance, I think that changes the calculation right. of how risky it is. So from right. my comfort level personally would be like, at least that age group would be eligible. I mean, that's just me, but. I'm, I'm with you and that's why I'm thinking middle school to high school, right? 12 up. They they have that opportunity and high school definitely has had it for a while. And that's why I'm curious why we wouldn't allow that at least at that age range. So, Mr. Etherton, we met with the Orange County Health Department and our um, partners at Chapel Hill um, Scarborough City Schools Friday at our biweekly um, meeting. And we did ask specifically about this. And at this time, the Strong um, Schools Toolkit requires that all of our students be masked indoors and outdoors. That is not an option for us. That is the um, guidelines. It is not recommended. It's a requirement. And um, Orange County Health Department stands by this. And while, uh, you know, there are still, you know, every um, day there are changes coming up at this time. Those are the requirements we are um, expected to adhere to. So the toolkit does not apply to athletics. I I need to break in there. The, the toolkit does not require masks outdoors. It is my understanding that Orange County wanted, decided to maintain that in consultation with the health department, but it is not a statewide requirement. Okay. Well, I stand corrected based on our conversation with Orange County Health Department, and um, I know that. Sharita, you were there, so please correct me if I have my notes wrong, but they are um, saying that students are to be masked at all times. Indoors yes. And outdoors. yes, the health department had, did say that in our meeting on last week. They are still recommending that we do that for us and Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools. And the Ms. other Miley? part is that the, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Ms. Cobb, I'm sorry, no, that you were done. I was just going to reiterate that the other side of that is the athletic piece is driven by the North Carolina High School Athletic Association. And, and that is separate from the Strong Schools Kid. Yeah, I, I would just like to say, I would like to have us, us to have another conversation with the health department about the older kids and that opportunity for them to not have masks, especially when they have the opportunity to, to have the vaccines. Ms. Smiley. So um, I just have a clarification about the face coverings while competing. Um, so the way that I read the way that this is phrased is when student athletes are, you know, off the field, not competing, they're in a dugout or a sideline area and are not six feet from each other, that they are required to wear masks. But if they are actively playing soccer and getting up close to each other, that they are not required to wear masks. Is it is that accurate? Like if 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 a, if a if a particular sport involves you don't get six feet of distancing all the time, are those students required to wear masks because they're not able to socially distance? Or can you just clarify that? So my understanding, and Jason, please help me out with this, is that if the students are competing, actively competing, they can unmask. The masking is required if they are in the dugout on the sideline and unable to be six feet apart. So you are correct in what you said. Yes, that's correct. And I guess uh, just a reaction to that, you know, in the past we had um, stricter requirements than the High School Athletic Association, I believe. Um, and uh, I mean, lots of our older kids are getting vaccinated and everything, you know, cases are low and all those things, but to Will's point earlier, it seemed like the ABC collaborative was pretty clear that the cases they were seeing in high schools anyway, outbreaks were in sports like soccer where people were unable to be masked and distanced. And so, um, you know, so I do have some level of concern about going this direction without some knowledge about vaccination or something else. I just want it, it feels in conflict to me. Other comments? So I will share, you know, where I'm at personally is if age groups are old enough to be vaccinated, I am comfortable 
turning over authority about masking back to the district and letting Dr. Feller talk to the health department and ABC Science Collaborative and make a decision without our approval. So, so what I'm hoping we will do tonight is just accept their recommendations and um, turn it back over. So we don't have to call special meetings if the, the recommendations change over the summer, for example. Um, that that would be what I would hope to see us do um, with the understanding that we would follow this is I'm saying this really more for the general public that we would follow the governor's mandates. Of course, we would not remove requirements for any school level before the children at that school. All the kids in that school would be eligible for vaccination. Um, and that masks would always be allowed for any student or family who wanted their student to wear one. Those would be my comfort zones with turning turning it back over to the district. Mr. Atherton? Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, the only request I would have is that we actually do go back to the orange health. Orange County Health Department and ask to your point if the older kids that have the opportunity if they would be supportive of that because I I agree we can about turning it back over but I I'd like to see us a little more proactive on you know getting to that point especially with kids that have been vaccinated so that would only be high school for us though because there are 11 year olds in our middle schools. Anyway, that's just my two cents. That's why, for whatever that's why I'm saying older kids. That's why I said older kids. But yeah. but to that point, you should keep in mind too. There's athletics in middle school too. So. Well, it changes the calculation for me if you're not eligible for vaccination for my personal comfort level. So board remember uh, I'd like to say something, but I don't know if I'm even. Under oh, no, I'm sorry. I couldn't see you, but please go right ahead. Well, I wasn't sure that I'm even like hearable right now. Am I okay to be heard? You are. We can hear you loud and clear. Just can't see you. Okay. 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 Um, so listening to um, the ABC on some things, I do think there was a distinction between types of sports and I don't remember, you know, listening to Dr. Benjamin, some, uh, some of his webinars distinguishing between indoor and outdoor sports um, in terms of risk. And I, I do hope we continue pursuing, I, I, I do you know they've spoken about, um, just as y'all were saying that as kids are vaccinated, I hope there is an option to not wear masks at least. At, so I'm, I'm supportive of moving in that direction, but I also agree with turning it back over to Dr. Felder. So if I could just um, add that Dr. Benjamin personally read the message that went out um, about a week or so ago. Again, I consulted with him first um, on a Sunday. <laughs> and um, uh, again, it, this was his feedback and um, he actually uh, laid eyes on the message. The message aligns to uh, what he advised Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools. Again, we also met with the Orange County Health Department. I mean, we are consulting with, this is not our area of expertise. We are consulting with the medical professionals uh, and they had no problem and support what we are presenting today. We continue to work with them. This situation continues to evolve. Who knows, tomorrow we may have a different update to share, but uh, we continue to consult with our medical and health professionals who are well versed with COVID-19 and will hang tightly to their guidance. So board, how should we proceed? Is there a motion? Ms. Hauser, are you raising your hand? I think I'll raise my hand. I first, I, um, are, um, are we, can we have a, just, well, I'll, I'll try a motion. Um, that will move forward as allowed to relax mask restrictions um, and give Dr. Felder the authority to make that decision. 
So I'd like to do both pieces. So uh, I'm putting both. So so we'll relax restrictions and we're so the motion is that the district will relax mask requirements as were permitted by the school 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 kit and guide trimmer advisors and as vaccinations become available to younger students and that we will authorize Dr. Felder to make these decisions in the future without seeking board, um, without seeking board approval. So okay. just for clarity, Ms. Hauser, was that that we will not remove mask mandates for any grade level until, or any school until all of the students in that school are eligible for vaccination? No, no, not at all. Quite the reverse. That we will relax the requirements as vaccinations become available. So we could begin at when Strong School says or the governor says that we can relax the requirements for high school um, for vaccinated kids. Then I think we should go ahead and do that. All right. All right. We need. Mr. Atherton. Uh, well, what I heard was. Um, you give the superintendent authority to make those decisions as they change along with the entities that were mentioned and advisors. So the board isn't saying you're removing masks. We're saying we're giving the superintendent the authority to to make those decisions as she interacts with those groups. That's that's my understanding of the motion. Yeah, yeah. well, that's that's the important part. And I guess I was including an intention that we're going to be moving as a district to relax the mask restrictions as we're permitted to do so. So I, I need to clarify there because are you moving to approve the superintendent's recommendation that was made in the PowerPoint or the strong schools toolkit because they are different? The superintendent is recommending a more conservative approach. Well, I think if we're going to let Dr. Felder decide, then she gets to decide. So yes, so we so we will go with the recommendation, but we're also giving Dr. Felder the authority to relax it as she's comfortable doing so. How's that? Okay, so, so if I can the the motion. I'm sorry, a motion to approve the administration's recommendation for tonight plus authorize them to further relax standards as they deem appropriate as 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 they deem appropriate based on their guidance okay guidance yes from the health department and abc science collaborative is that what you mean Bonnie? Mm -hmm. yes okay we have a motion on the table is there a second second have a motion from Ms. Hauser and a second for Mr. Atherton. Is there any question or discussion before we vote? Ms. Smiley? I just I just want to make sure I understand that. So that's contingent upon um, the recommendations of the health department and ABC Science Collaborative, right? That was what the motion was? I couldn't quite hear very well. But yeah, and the motion is Dr. Felder gets to consider their advice and she gets to decide. So it gives her, but she's been working with her based on the advice of her partners. But it's Dr. Felder's decision is where it sits. I mean, I'll just say speaking for myself that if her recommendation did not align with the recommendations of the health department, I don't think she would do that. But I'm just saying then I I, I wouldn't be comfortable authorizing that. So, I mean, if that's what is contingent, you know, I'll just say that. Dr. Felder, um, I think that there are several of us who would feel better uh, before we call this vote if you could say whether you will be following ABC Science Collaborative and the Health Department in your recommendations <laughs> definitively. Absolutely. Okay. That's, yep. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, in that case, I will vote yes. Ms. Moore? Yes. Ms. Smiley? Yes. Ms. Stevens? Yes. Mr. Atherton? Yes. And Ms. Doyle votes yes. 
So we have approved the recommendations for masking updates and we have turned it over to Dr. Felder. So we will defer to her moving forward on masking. Next up is the OCS Online Academy. Welcome, Dr. Gammon. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, members of the board and community. Uh, this evening, I will be sharing an update on our planning process for the Orange County Schools Online Academy. Um, as part of this evening's update, um, I will be sharing the most recent data from the family interest surveys, um, as well as an estimated cost analysis. Um, for this evening, we will be asking the board to take action and determine if Orange County Schools should proceed um, with opening an Orange County Schools Online Academy. Um, at our last board meeting on May 10th, I shared the latest Senate bill noting that only districts who received authorization uh, to open a new virtual school with its own school number prior to May 1st of this year uh, may offer a virtual option next school year. Orange County Schools did apply and received a new school number for the Orange County Schools Online Academy. It is only at this virtual school that we can offer a virtual or remote school option for the 2021-22 school year. As of May 20th, 205 family responses were compiled. Please be aware that after digging deeper into the individual family responses, there were instances where families may have submitted multiple responses for the same student, thus increasing the total to 179 students um, who expressed interest in attending the online academy. This approximate total as of the May 20th data pool is actually closer to 170 students who've expressed interest when you take away some of those duplicates um, that are interested in attending the Orange County Schools Online Academy. These totals will be re reflected as such on the next slide. Um, as stated previously, Orange County Schools recommended a minimum threshold of 100 students uh, to consider moving forward with the, R with the Online Academy option. Um, of those who expressed interest, there are approximately 55 high school students, 52 middle school students, and 72 elementary school students. Next slide, please. As you can see on this slide, there is a steady amount of interest across all grade levels. Uh, please note that these are rising grade level totals, meaning current kindergartners are reflected on this slide as first grade. Current 11th graders, for example, are reflected on this side as 12th grade, or on this slide as 12th grade, as this will be the grade level they'll be in next year. It's also important to acknowledge that due to a few instances where multiple responses, as I noted before, were populated for the same student, the overall total is slightly lower than the 179 that you see projected here, and it's closer to 170 um, as of the May 20th data pool. Next slide, please. Within the total number of students who expressed interest in attending the Orange County Schools Online Academy, as you can see on the left column, there are 31 total students receiving EC or 504 services with 16 of those at the elementary level, less than five at the middle grades and 13 at the high school level. In the middle column, students receiving AIG services are reflected with 10 of those at the elementary level, seven at the middle grades and less than five at the high school level. And lastly, at the far right column, it shows the total amount of English language learners um, as less than five who have expressed interest um, overall. Next slide, please. On this slide, we dive even deeper into the data to determine the total number of students by ethnicity uh, that are interested in attending the Orange County Schools Online Academy. On the far left column, White students totaled 87, with 32 students coming from the elementary level, 24 at the middle grades, and 31 at the high school level. In the second column from the left, a total number of 43 Black students have expressed interest in attending the online academy, with 14 coming from the elementary level, 16 at the middle grades, and 13 at the high school level. In the third and middle column, a total of 19 Hispanic students 
are represented with five coming from the elementary level, seven at the middle grades, and seven at the high school level. The next column depicts multi-race students with a total of eight at the elementary level, less than five at the middle grades, and five at the high school level. Next slide, please. To proceed with the K-12 Orange County Schools Online Academy, there will be costs associated with staffing and curriculum materials to adequately meet the needs of our students. To allot a principal, social worker, and counselor for the Online Academy, it will cost approximately $265,000 total. Through our team's analysis of different curriculum and staffing options, we recommend option one, which entails purchasing a fully equipped K-12 curriculum with adjunct teachers provided through the purchase platform. Through this model, students will receive synchronous live instructional options from teachers during regular school hours and a viable curriculum. In addition to providing teachers of record that are adjunct through the program, we can also consider contracting Orange County Schools teachers as learning coaches in a similar fashion to our, our current self-paced model, and they can serve as an additional support after hours and on weekends if necessary. This method does not limit our students to only accessing learning coaches beyond typical school hours or to receiving instruction strictly in an asynchronous fashion. That said, we wish to reiterate that even with purchasing a fully viable online curriculum, there will still be limitations in course offerings. For example, courses such as IB, Project Lead the Way and others, as we've mentioned in, on previous board sessions, will not be available if students choose this online academy option. Another important point to highlight is while our school and district staff have worked diligently to shift our in-person curriculum to blended curriculum options in the form of blueprint courses this year uh, as part of our shift to remote learning due to COVID, we do not currently have curriculum options in the form of blue excuse me we do not currently have blueprint courses for all grade level content areas additionally these courses still have elements of synchronous instruction uh, to function effectively requiring direct instruction from orange county school staff uh, which entails providing staff during school hours doing so will prove problematic as noted in option two as it would require us to reallocate teacher allotments from schools this is not preferred because our top priority is to keep schools whole. One way to potentially make option two feasible would require attracting retired teachers to serve in this capacity, uh, which would ensure current teacher allotments at schools are not impacted and that students can be served during regular school hours. Next slide, please. Lastly, our team is continuing to work within the Orange County Schools Online Academy timeline as shared at the May 10th board meeting. The goal this evening is to finalize the decision on the opening of the Orange County Schools Online Academy. Moving forward, we will continue to engage in the planning and preparation process, including but not limited to refining the curriculum and staffing options, determining school leadership and support staff and holding orientation for prospective families in advance of an August opening. Next slide. At this time, I'd like to pause for questions. Ms. Hauser. I have a couple. Thank you for this. Um, the, the, the process makes sense, decision makes sense. When you did the survey, did the parents were the parents told that this will be an asynchronous offering or were they just was there an expectation so the initial survey that went out um, it, it was phrased in, in that way um, dr dawson may be able to speak to if, if there were any um, caveats to that my understanding when we sent it out initially was was yes it was noted as asynchronous at that time as we had shared at a previous board meeting that would be correct, Dr. Graham, and we were very clear in um, laying out the um, criteria for an online academy, which um, absolutely stated that this was mainly an asynchronous model. 
because part of um, being asynchronous would also allow our families the flexibility to make this fit on their schedule, but that we did include that there would be synchronous opportunities, especially when we would see that students needed additional um, tutoring or support. But yes, it's very um, clear that this was an asynchronous, uh, mainly an asynchronous model. Excuse me, Dr. Dawson, and uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Hauser. I just wanted uh, Dr. Dawson and or uh, Dr. Gammon to elaborate on the asynchronous part because my understanding is that would still exist and um, be available for families if they wanted a mostly asynchronous uh, model. So can you speak to that as well, please? Sure, and, and that's one of the um, reasons why we are recommending option one to allow for asynchronous instruction. So the, what would happen is the students would access classes that have already been pre-recorded. The teachers are teaching their lesson and assigning assignments and the students would be able to you know, access that anytime during the day that fits their schedule. But also at the same time, um, there are opportunities where they can be on with the teacher doing the live teaching. And this is why we are recommending that we purchase the, the um, curriculum and on a platform that will allow this flexibility and access for students and the families. And the, um, also why we are recommending this option because when we purchase a program, it provides, and what we're saying is, purchase a program that will provide the teacher of record. That will be the main um, on record, the teacher is gonna be teaching the course, that will be um, assigning the assignments, correcting the homework and the quizzes and providing feedback to the students, just like they would receive if attending in person. Um, that would not, be feasible for our learning coaches to provide that level and on that um, timeline and scale because of course our learning coaches teach full time all day but we could look to assign learning coaches just like we have in our current self-paced model because the learning coaches they continue to act as an academic advisor and tutor they monitor how are our students doing, are they keeping pace with the level of work that they need to be doing, and then, you know, it would help bring um, communication with the school. So having a teacher of record, the learning coaches would check in if they needed to um, communicate with the teacher of record to say, how can we get our student additional support and more help? So this is, um, it's been working well with our self-paced model currently. And that's why we're recommending um, that we proceed with that model. Is, is that Dr. Dawson, what you were saying, Dr. Felder? If I could just follow up. Um, Dr. Felder, I mean, Dr. Dawson, um, are you all going to be um, proposing that we use Edmontum for this? What we are proposing is that we um, look at the options that are available because you know Edmentum was only one and we you know offered that under circumstances uh, that we all know last year but at this time we are not recommending that we use Edmentum what we would be recommending is that we look to see what other options there are and go through a vetting process and find what is the right fit for our family and students. Are there other I know you did a lot of research about this last um, summer, were there lots of other platforms available that have this sort of uh, teachers of record that you can hire? Is that going to be a feasible thing to find other options? I at this time I wouldn't want I, I don't want to say there are lots, but are there absolutely? And there are options, um, and we would definitely look into that uh, before making any final decision. And I think you know what, um, just like we did last year. You know, pulling together a team to take a look at what the different options are, what are the characteristics and criteria of an online platform that would align with the standards and, um, you know, is the best fit for what it is. So I don't want to say lots, Ms. McKenzie, but there are other options out there. Okay, and my, I guess my um, request for that process would be that we have teachers from our district kind of be involved in that process and Dr. Keeling also just to make sure Absolutely. that we're 
in a line with other things that students throughout our district will be doing. So thank you. Other board members? Yes. Um, Ms. Hauser yes, and Ms. Smiley. Up. On, on the, the question on asynchronous, the, the, you don't have to answer this, but the essence of the question is how solid is the number? So I understood the law, if we have less than 100 students, we don't have, right, we have to have at least 100 students in the virtual academy to offer it, is that correct? Um, I thought that's, that's the, was the legislation. But I just wondered how solid uh, the numbers are, and I, you don't have to answer that, I don't think we know yet. And then the other question I have is, will the principals be allowed to weigh in? So might there be a case where a family might be fearful, um, but but the prince, the school really would like to see the student in school and not, you know, that virtual is not really working for them. So uh, will the principals get a chance to weigh in on whether this is the right venue or medium for their students? Yes, so um, yeah. part of what uh, we shared um, previously and with families is that the um, approval would go through as part of the approval process would include the principals and um, conversation to an interview process to ensure that this is the best fit for the child. Um, and of course, you know, we our, we may have opportunity about situations where our families do not agree. They may want the online uh, academy where our principals may not recommend that that is in the best interest of their children. But, and, and of course we would reiterate why. And then if families are adamant that um, based on their concerns and their needs, their um, you know, desire is still to proceed with the online academy, that we would have an understanding that at some point, and we would have, you know, we would be very clear in what those points are at the level of, you know, attendance and student performance. That if the child with all of the supports provided by the online academy um, are not able to maintain where we need them to as far as attendance and proficiency, then or um, performance, that the student would have to return back to in person at their attendance zone school. Smiley. I mean, that's great. Um, just a couple of small follow-up questions. Did we go back to the uh, people who responded with middle and high schoolers after the vaccine eligibility to double check that they are still interested in this? Have we done that yet? So we have not. as far as, yeah, as far as this survey, we have not. Okay. Um, so uh, that makes to Ms. Hauser's question about how solid, solid is this number? Um, that makes me wonder how much that's going to go down. Um, and the synchronous versus asynchronous instruction, about what percentage of each do you expect, roughly? So, I mean, at this time, I would say, depending on what those curriculum options are and like how the, like, like what that scope and sequence looks like and the way that their instructional design, that model looks on a day-to-day -day basis would really inform how much the, the synchronous versus asynchronous would be. Um, I don't think we could answer it fully today but you're but you're looking for a model that would include both was what i understood that would include both that would be ideal okay great um and then just one final comment which is um i saw that you added the social worker and counselor um to the model which i think is great um and with small enough numbers um you know it may be that those staff members are only needed 50 percent of time for the online academy and the other 50 percent could serve a school that has higher needs um in person so to that. Mr. Atherton? Um, so the first question I had is, um, have we talked to Chapel Hill about this opportunity of working together and maybe sharing some of the cost of this? Yes, we did um, meet with Chapel Hill um, since our last board session. Um, we have had a, an initial conversation with them um, with the intent of continuing that dialogue um, beyond this evening um, that they have expressed an interest in it, it. We've expressed one mutually, but I think we're trying to work through 
um, the different elements of what kind of their focus is as far as specific grade bands and then what we're also trying to accommodate and seeing if there is a way to, to feasibly work that out um, together. So there will be more to come of that. Okay, because I, I have talked to a peer and they, they indicated there was interest as well to try to accommodate since we're all in orange. Um, so the back of the envelope calculation that I got for this was the principal social worker counselor self paced high school for 617k is six well 16 617,400 is what the back of the envelope estimate is that I see is that correct based off of these estimated numbers that would be um, I, I do believe that as we proceed with planning, and, and it's noted here on the timeline, like that that number could fluctuate one way or the other. I know that, that Ms. Rath and her team has been in close conversation with us around what this will look like to make sure that it's fully staffed um, appropriately and that we have you know proper curriculum in place. Right, Well, because one of the questions I had was translation services, uh, and are they gonna be available with the classes or you know how how is that going to be done because i it's not explicitly in here but i assume as you're going through you're going to to need to add those services um i guess the other question i had was for miss rat um i thought the board had prior approved 400k going towards this is that correct i'd have to go look through my notes and i didn't want to Missed the presentation on this, but I thought we had priorly approved 400 K. Mr. Atherton, um, I recall there were some discussions surrounding um, the budget that went to the commissioners about potentially um, allocating $400,000 to online academy. I am not recalling any formal board action because these will be ESSER dollars that are going to be utilized. So the funding would be coming from there and the $400,000 uh, that was previously discussed was a placeholder that we had included in our budget discussions as an anticipated cost for this coming from those ESSER funds. We would not be utilizing uh, funds from um, fund balance or any other source. That's exactly where I was headed with the question, Ms. Rapp. Thank you so much. I, I was curious if this was moving to ESSER dollars, and now that you jog my memory, I, I remember we talked about it, but not approving the allocation, so ESSER dollars. Um, okay, and, and I have one last question. I'm not sure who it's for is one of the key elements I think we talked about here was um, the availability of families to participate in sports. And it, if, we, if that's still true, uh, is there going to be a coordinator that helps with this, that checks students' grades, or is that gonna be upon the, the, the schools to do that themselves that, that are districted or still working through those details? So, I'm so, yeah, go I'm ahead, gonna this one back again. Okay. Yeah, you're fine. So, you go ahead. Okay. So yes, um, students would be eligible to participate with their um, attendance zoned school athletics, and the um, the athletic the coaches um, at the school would you know just like any player that they have would be responsible for checking eligibility. And um, you know, with grades and all of that, there would not be um, a staff person on um, online academy staff to to um, take care of that. And it was shared with the families that they could participate in athletics um, with their attendance zone high school. I think that there is an opportunity here that once we make this more formal and announce that there will be a K through 12 online academy and share out the specifics of the program. I do believe that we will have families who are um, interested from homeschooling and charter schools and outside of the district that may be interested in this option that they may not have at um, other schools. 
just like um, last year, I think, you know, we had families with homeschooled children that were interested, but I know that one of the challenges there was they were looking for a more asynchronous op um, option with, you know, access to the curriculum. And at the beginning of last year, when we started this, we did not have that option. It was only um, later did we start that self-paced. So we know that there's an interest out there. And I think once we, um, you know, advertise that this is an opportunity that we may see interest from outside of our district in this academy. Also, I just wanted to note that, you know, as we start this, it's almost like startup costs with the ESSER dollars. We know that ESSER dollars will end, but in the three years where, you know, we will be building for sustainability and then taking a look at how else we'll be able to fund the you know, maintaining and um, ongoing opening of the school after ESSER dollars. And so by then we should have um, increased enrollment and uh, other options at how we're going to staff versus paying out of grant dollars, which we would have after that. Okay, so I apologize to the board. I do have two questions that are in line with this. And um, the two questions are for sports. I assume we're not providing transportation. They would be responsible for getting to and from just as everybody else would if they had a practice that was later or needed to drive there that we're not providing transportation in those cases. And then sure. the other question, um, that I had beyond, um, well, I, I'll let I'll let another board member speak. Um, if there's other questions, Ms. Doyle. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I, it seems like um, a really expensive thing to start up. I'm not saying I'm opposed to it, but it just it's kind of a lot to take in. For the numbers, and I guess 1 question I have is, um, is this. I was thinking along the lines of what you were just saying, Dr. Dawson, with in a sense that this is startup. Is this something we really envision growing? You know, if, if COVID sort of winds down over the next. 6 months or so, do we still feel like the desire for this is going to grow and that we're starting something that's. That we're planning on growing, I mean, what if we invest all this money and there just isn't that much participation. I, I have some thoughts about that. And and finally, one particular question. I'm always catching, my arrow always gets caught on the preparing the brick and mortar location. What is, what is that gonna mean exactly? So I'll start with that ladder, um, preparing the brick and mortar. So yes, this is an online academy, but should students need to come in for additional training and or for testing that this is um, a place where the kids can physically come to to meet those requirements and also as we um, get staff that they would also need to be housed. So we're at this time we're looking at the welcome center um, as an option for location. So that would be um, identifying an office space, some classroom spaces, which are already there. So it wouldn't be a huge um, upfit cost to do, you know, to prepare brick and mortar a location. The other piece, as far as, you know, do we see this, you know, what's the viability of the sustainability of an online academy beyond, especially beyond next year, when, you know, an, number of our families have indicated that they're looking for this option because of their concerns about returning to school still with um, COVID health concerns. So we do know that, um, you know, there are a number of districts, uh, actually a lot more than we think, I think, because when I was looking them up, them up uh, I was surprised at how many online academies there are across the country within school districts. And so this is not something that we're starting that is just, um, you know, something that is just a, a moment in time. This is an opportunity. We do know that we have students that, you know, this is the best fit for them for a number of reasons, um, not just COVID related. And so I think um, we are look, planning as this to be a long-term and not just a short-term 
uh, it would not make sense, Ms. Doyle, as you're stating, to look at this and approach it that it's a short term uh, solution. We do have to look at this as long term because it is uh, investment in funding to support the start of an online academy. I think to it, there are other options that we we can take a look at. Now we are, you know, taking a look at here's the budget. We need a principal, a counselor, or a social worker, but that doesn't necessarily mean, especially if our enrollment is really where it's at, that they have to be full time counselors, um, social workers. So you know, the cost we we went on the high end, but it is possible to have the lower end because we don't need um, necessarily a full time counselor or social worker at you know, the start of the academy. If we can, you know, find the funding and have that, that'd be great, but that's not something that we have to have full time in order to make this work. So we would, you know, look at how do we provide those services for our students? And is there a way to do that without it um, costing as much as we are? But we wanted to propose the, you know, the maximum um, dollar amount as we are reviewing this. Can I, can really? I ask one follow up? I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. That's okay, Carrie, go ahead. Um, well, just regarding the, um, the idea about the welcome center, are we, is there I'm trying to think how big the welcome center is and um, thoughts about exploring using that for partnership academy, would that exclude the potential of using the welcome center for partnership academy or is there space to accommodate both programs? I would think that there would be space to accommodate both in the sense that um, some of the larger spaces, uh, you know, may be shared at different times. But when you think about what brick and mortar portion of a virtual academy needs, it's very minimal. So if you're having, um, you know, a principal, you think about like one office space area. And then if we have a you know, counselor and social worker, they may be another office space area. And then outside of that, it's, it's you know, having a classroom size about, right, um, available for students to come in. So it's, you know, looking at like three rooms. And of course, in the Welcome Center, we know that there are more than three rooms. So it could be a shared. Um, and because most often students are not coming in person for online academy, that it wouldn't be um, disruptive to partnership should partnership be located there. So it's um, it's very doable to do. Yeah. Miss mm -hmm. Smiley and then Mr. Atherton. Um, I, I just wanted to share a um, reaction to the idea of this being a sustained thing for the district over the long term. I think it would be a good idea to gauge the board's appetite for that if that seems more like what we're going to do. I, I envisioned this as a short term solution. Um, I think we are a very small district to sustain an entire online academy. Um, I also think that online charter schools anyway, historically have very poor academic results. And so I understand, you know, we've heard from families that this is working for well this year and that's, and I understand the need in the coming year, but in terms of um, uh, creating something that we intend to sustain, I am personally not, um, I would, it would take some convincing um, <laughs> and some good academic outcomes um, in order to think that that was what we should do. But in the short term, we have the ESSER dollars. So, um, and obviously families with health situations and things like that, that there's a need. Yeah. I, I just want to say um, one thing in response to that, Ms. Smiley, especially when we think about, you know, shifting of schools and switching schools for our children, which I know that you're very much aware of the piece that I think about are for our high school students, that if they go down this path, you know, they're starting there, I think it will be really important for them to understand that there is a very likelihood, because we did share with them that, you know, once you leave your traditional high school and sign up for the online academy, that you would be receiving your diploma from the online academy. And so if this is a short term, um, solution in response to COVID, I just want to make sure that we're very clear with our high school students, right? That, okay, if you come here for a year, two years, even three years, if I am 
you know, it, according to what grade I am in high school and looking at how will that impact where I get my transcript from, which school, what, you know, what's the school that's going to be on my diploma, those kind of things that um, I know that matter, you know, to high school students. And so I think it is important that however the board votes tonight, that we're just clear if, if that is your thought, which I, of course, respect. I just want to be very clear, especially to our high school families, to let them know that what are what is it that they're choosing, and and what does that mean when it's time for them to graduate? What does that mean when they're alumni? You know, a number of years later, that their high school will no longer exist. I think it's um, those are the kind of things that we, I think, want to think about for our families. That, you know, that they might not think about in this moment. Other comments from the board, Mr. Atherton? Yeah, I just wanted to respond to the Welcome Center and partnership. I would prefer partnership go in there. We've talked about making a middle college, you know, all the area. Uh, I would prefer myself uh, that that space be left to partnership to expand. And I think to a point made earlier, you know, the social worker, for example, could sit in central elementary where they have a great need and maybe they can use part of their time with uh, that school or a counselor or take over the space that partnership was in. But, you know, it, it's time for partnership to have a real space and have, you know, the facilities available and expansion. Um, to um, Ms. Smiley's point, I, you know, I, I'm open to see what happens with this. And if Chapel Hill's with us, I think there's some ability to sustain it. But, you know, if the academics aren't there, uh, we shouldn't be enabling it. But, um, you know, I'm more than willing to, to, to see how this goes. But uh, to Ms. Smiley's point, I, I do have concerns if the academics aren't there to support it and us funding that. But I have, you know, heard people that say, this has been great, you know, I don't have to deal with the stress. And most of those comments have been at the middle school and the high school, not at the, you know, elementary levels. But uh, I just wanted to share, you know, those, those things. And the, the last one is, um, when you were talking earlier about charter schools and homeschool, I believe the expectation would be that they are fully enrolled in this, that they would not be in the charter schools anymore. Um, that, you know, I think there's the ability to have some dual enrollment, but we're expecting that they would be fully enrolled and we would be getting ADM for these students, correct? So the plan would be that they would have to be fully enrolled with us, correct? And not dual enrolled. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, the plan is that they would be fully enrolled with us. We have not discussed the dual enrollment option as it yet. I, I mainly say that because I know in the past people have asked to play sports in our district. And I, I think we're saying, yep, but you're coming in, you're all in. But at the same time, uh, to Ms. Smiley's point, I would hate to tell somebody, yes, come on. And they go, no, we're kidding. You have to go to district back here. But I, I still would want, you know, to put some contention for, you know, some contingency around the, the scores and the success of the program versus the volume of people. But anyway, thank you. So, you know, I think that tonight we just need to decide if we want to move forward with the online academy for this coming year. And anytime we start something new, there's lots of question marks and how it's going to go. And I think families need to come into this opportunity with the understanding that we got to see how this year goes. If it's if it's not acceptable, then, you know, who knows what will happen in the future? But I, I do think that. Um, I know our team, I know they're going to work really hard to make it a great opportunity for our students. 
And um, personally, I'm supportive of it, particularly in this coming year with, um, you know, folks still having some concerns about COVID. So um, unless there is more discussion, um, Ms. Hauser. I just wanted to make a motion to move forward Great. with option one on the virtual academy, and then we see you'll come back and tell us what the actual enrollment will be, right? Because then we'll need to, is that when we make the decision to move forward? Right? So the first thing is what are you going to offer? Right? That's a decision you're asking us to make now, correct? Dr. Dawson, that you're we're, an advisor? We're, because it will be, you know, we, we have a lot of work to do, right? To, to make this happen. And so we're asking, that the board, I think if you go to the next slide, um, we're asking that um, the board approve the opening of the new OCS online academy per the superintendent's recommendation. And what we're, you know, what we recommended earlier is that it would be option one, okay. that we are, you know, the, the recommendation is option one, that we would purchase an online platform that allows for asynchronous instruction with the teacher of record. Um, so that's our recommendation and we need your approval for us to actually start this new school so that we can start doing all of the vetting of new curriculum that we normally would in, you know, starting a new school, um, doing and, and all of the other logistics and communication plan to ensure that families are, are aware of what they are I'm enrolling in. Um, so yes, so we're Ms. Hauser, we are requesting your um, the board's approval on accepting the superintendent's recommendation to open the new OCS online academy for 21-22 school year. Second so I just want clarity on how much this is approving. Right, because the back of the envelope says right now it's 700 or well, 617 K. And I would not feel comfortable making that unlimited. And, and the other side of it, we don't, we don't really know what the denominator is. Right. We don't know how many students. I mean, if, if, you know, you could get 300 students to enroll and you could get 50. But if 50 students end up enrolling because the vaccines out for kids over 12 and the teachers don't think their kids, well, I'm just making it up, you know, that you may get a lower number. And then would you come back to us and say, not sure, we might want to do something. And then there's Will's question about working with Capitol Hill. You know, so there's a bunch of questions that need, you know, so I would, if I'd like you to move forward, I want to support option one. I don't want a hybrid option, so I, I support virtual academy option one, but I think you have to come back to it and we should go forward with that. But you may come back to us and say, not quite working the way we expected and we just want you to have. So, so what happens then? So as you know, as in all things that we do, we will ensure that we are following the guidelines of DPI as far as requirements right, and expectations for when opening the school. As we always do, we will be um, fiscally prudent and um, make wise decisions around what is, you know, um, prudent to spend on what. And of course, as always, if anything in our decision-making that we know that this requires board approval, we will always bring that back to the board. There will be no um, decisions made that require board approval that we will, you know, go forward without bringing it back. So it's a lot of the, the questions that have been raised here, you know, so there are some, some of the limitations as to being able to answer it fully is we need to, if we're going to open, we need to be able to start the process. This is where we now go back, reach out to those families who've shown an interest, because again, this is an interest survey, but then we have to go back out and let families know, like, this is no longer an interest survey. We are opening up application. We will have to do all of the marketing that comes with that to do outreach, not only with our students in the district, but outside of the district so that they are aware. We will have to, you know, identify the appropriate platform and all the things that are in the purview of the superintendent, we will do anything that that requires the board, of course, we will bring back. And we will always 
Um, we always, you know, we take our responsibility to spend our taxpayers' dollars um, smart. I mean, we, of course, will always be mindful of, hey, is this um, worthy of this type of investment and what will be, you know, our return on investment? And so I just share that. Thank you, Dr. Dawson. We'll have a motion on the table in a second. So, Mr. Atherton? Um, I would like to see if the two would uh, accept an amendment to say if it's above 617K that they will come back with a modification. So, at least we understand what the amounts would be. And if the enrollment drops below 100. Correct. Well, you're going to have to vote that amendment. So that is the motion to amend the original amendment. With the 617K and if uh, membership drops below 100 to come back to the board. I mean, aren't they going to have to come with curriculum purchases and contracts like that anyway? Yeah. I, my concern is we're, we're not specifying how much. We're saying go open it. That's what this says. That's what we are approving. Yeah, but, they but we also have a, Ms. Dubison, do we not have a policy that any contract above the threshold of the superintendent's approval has to come to us? That's right, and you do approve the budget amendments as they come along. And I do, I, I have a, a slight question about that Ms. Rath, I don't know if she's still in the meeting about, I mean, I mean how do you know when it goes above 617K for a school? If, you're sharing a council with this school and, you know, I, I think that might be hard to put a boundary around. And how do we are you asking? Sorry, Ms. Rath, please go ahead. I, I apologize. I'm trying to get a little clarity, Ms. Dubison. Are you inquiring as to how we would keep track of a counselor? I, I guess the way that this was proposed is that it would be a dedicated counselor to this school. We can split in the event that a full one was not needed and needed to say be 50% at the online academy and then 50% at another one of our schools who had higher populations. There is mechanisms in our account codes to allow us to uh, track that by school location. Is uh, that what you are referring yeah, to? Yeah, the, the counselor was just an example. I was just noting that this the expenses are not always going to fall into neat buckets, that there are many things that are shared among schools. That's all I meant. Oh, okay, yeah. How I, in, I would envision that the intent would be to be able to track all expenditures by a school. I think that I, there's two really uh, big things that are going to affect these numbers. One is for the 179 people who have said they want to attend to actually confirm them now that the vaccines are out for the older kids and that the teachers, their principals and school of record, the current school of record, supports them going. So I think that there's been 200 people that we need to confirm with. And then the other point is, is are we gonna do this with Chapel Hill? Because that affects the cost structure dramatically. And until we can answer those two questions, these other questions can't get answered. And everything about this changes depending on the answer to those two questions. So is it possible to get, so, so, you know, to me, I'm saying if we're going to do it, it's going to be option one, not option two. So I'm there all the way on that decision. Whether we're going to go forward with the full fledged virtual academy can't answer that until we have a better idea of what the enrollment really looks like and if we're doing it with Chapel Hill. So how do I go there? Ms. Smiley, did you want to say something? I mean, I, I think I'm wondering if, I, I mean, I agree that I, um, would have some concerns if the cost of this blew up, but I'm wondering if we can just sort of express that sentiment to Dr. Dawson and Dr. Gammon and staff. And um, if the numbers start, if they start getting quotes from curriculum companies or whatever, and the costs start looking really out of line, to just be aware that we need to have a conversation because that's that may be a version of this online academy we're less comfortable with. Like, does it need to be like a 
hard line where they need to be tracking those numbers, I guess, per Will's point. So, Mr. Atherton, do you want to retract that or do you want me to call a vote on it? I like us to have some number. I mean, I, I you know, is it 40% of these numbers or within 50, which would be 1.2 million? You know, I, I just, this is an approval to open it. It's not, it's not saying if the contract's over 60,000, we are giving approval to open it with no defined top limit. I, I, I just have a concern with that. I, I would be willing to increase that number to 800 K, but after that, I would want to have a discussion about it to understand. You know, what are we doing at that point? So. I well, we have to approve the contracts that would make it that expensive. That's what I'm not understanding about this. Is asking. So, this says <laughs> the board to approve opening of the new Orange County Schools Online Academy. You're correct that we would get the principal's contract, we would get the social worker's contract, but some of these we're not going to know. I mean, I'm asking us to track it and at least know when we're getting over those because these could come on all different personnel reports unless we're looking at all these items. I, I don't know how we track it or have an expectation of how much the upper bound will be. I mean, do others not have a concern with this that we're okay with whatever the number comes in at? I guess if I can. I mean, one thought I have when I look at the estimates they're using, some of the estimates are per pupil, right? So if there are fewer students, it will cost less. And if there are more, it will cost more. Um, but we're unlikely to get, I mean, I think we're gonna see more students drop out than added. Um, you know, the only thing that seems um, more up in the air is option is, you know, is the 185K for the curriculum. And I'm presuming that number came from some estimates that were based on something where it's not wildly off, but. Yeah, we, we base that off of just like a $1,000 per people and, and just to multiply it was just a rough estimate. And that was without looking at, at a core curriculum or going through that process. So without, without, that's not based on like an understanding of that market. Correct. So it could be more than that. It could be $3,000 a student. It, and it could be, I mean, we would have to explore that, what that looks like in all of those different vendor options. Okay. I'd like to put a motion forward to just approve option one. That's why You've I'm already there. put motions on the table, Bonnie. It's too late for that. Late for that. So, so, <laughs> can, I, can I call on Ms. Doyle first, please? Ms. Doyle. This is, this is just really quick regarding the denominator. Could. Ms. Dubison or someone clarify, is there a threshold of students? Does it have to be 100 students? Like if it is 80 students, is it not happening because there's a, a minimum? It's 100, it's one, it's 100 students, Ms. Doyle, um, to open up a school is my understanding in North Carolina. And um, of course, again, we will you know go back to the families who have shown an interest and we will bring up, you know, now that we have this code uh, vaccination for students. Um, you know, are you still interested? We, you know, they, we will know because we did let the community know that we would um, have a decision on if we're going to be able to open this academy or not. Um, after tonight's board meeting, we again, like if. So I think I just want to be very clear that just because you, you know, we're asking the board for approval and you approve. If we don't have the 100 students, we can't open. If we have 100 students, but we are seeing that, you know what, a platform and a curricular platform is going to cost way too much. It just doesn't sound fiscally smart to do. Of course, we will bring it back to the board. We're not, you know, we're not going to go ahead and do something that we know requires more thought partnership and, you know, the advisement and approval of the board, we will not make those decisions without coming back to the board. And so, you know, just like Ms. McKenzie is saying that if there is a contract, we, there are very strict guidelines that policies that set that if it's going to be over $50,000, we always bring that to the board for approval. Um, 
this is starting of a new school. So, of course, we're going to be keeping you abreast of the plans all along the way. I think what we're asking for is your approval to give us some autonomy to move forward to try to get some an more answers to the questions that you have. And let me just share, you know, I did, I was able to join in for a, a bit on the meeting with Chapel Hill. And, you know, we didn't want to go into too, de too many details of that meeting just because so much of it is ambiguous and very much up in the air. But just so we're clear, I, th I think just to a little more detail, Chapel Hill, they are opening their own high school, a virtual high school that they are not looking to partner with us on. What they are looking to partner with us on are for grades four through eight because they they know that we were looking to open a K through 12. So because they're not offering a four through eight, they would like to partner with us for offering those grades. And then they would offer the nine through 12. So then we would send our virtual high school students that are interested to their online um, academy for the high school portion. So. This is again where you know you have to think about what will that entail, and so does that mean that for every high school student that goes to there, does the ADM with that high school student follow and go now to Chapel Hill, and then if their fourth through eighth grade um, students are coming to us, will their ADM follow and come here? And then when you take a look at how does all of that pricing and the dollar amount actually fall out, and then you know what will it cost us to offer that four through eight and and compared to the ADM that will follow. So there's a lot of lot of details that we would have to work out. But what we can't do is wait for all those things to be worked out and then try to open a school for August start and not start planning now. You know, we're 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 a little bit further behind than we would like to be in starting a new school. Um, and so we don't want to not have our own plans moving forward and wait for all of this, these other possibilities that we don't know if they're going to come to fruition. And, and then try to, to start a school. So that's why we're coming to you with our plans to start a school. And if some, you know, if a partnership with Chapel Hill somehow works out and there's an option then of course we'll bring that back um, to the board. Hey, Dr. Dawson. So mm -hmm. I'm going to call the vote for the amended. Um, oh, goodness gracious, yes, Mr. Atherton. Well, I will pull it back because I don't believe it was seconded. Okay. And so, with Dr. Dawson saying that, you know, if these license costs go up, that they would bring it back. I am willing to step back from that. Great. Ms. Hauser. A comment. You know, um, I'm hearing you say that once we go, it is a lot of work to build the curriculum to um, and to really enroll students and hire people and get it going. And there seems to me to be a couple of kind of Simple thing. I'm a little wor less worried about the cost side of it than I am about the enrollment side. So, um, and you just explained something about Chapel Hill said they'll take our high school kids and they'll give us four to eight if they want. So, if we take out our high school kids and our numbers drop, our numbers get very small. So, is there a way for us to get a, a basic under option one? Right, if people think it's going to be something other than option one, that's not what we're offering. Under option one, that's what we're offering. Is there a way to just get a validation that this plan makes sense? Um, so that's kind of what I, I thought we were moving to. You wanted approval on option one as the scope of this public, of this virtual charter school, but then we need to. I, it would be helpful to solidify the numbers before you go into the really hard work of, of doing that hard enrollment. So I just wondered if if you could do a top sided look first. So, but the most. So I do think that we'll continue to get lots of updates about this, and I am fe feeling like I need to call the vote so we can move to the part of our agenda where we have guests waiting. So I have a motion from Ms. Hauser and a second from Ms. Stevens 
to move forward with the online academy under option one with the understanding that of course they will bring back contracts and we will understand how this is moving forward and we will under be approving contracts as we move move along so mr atherton yes ms doyle yes ms hauser yes. i vote yes ms moore yes ms smiley yes ms stevens yes Thank you so much, everyone. We will move forward with option one and. I promise we will get updates to everyone. Um, I would like to request um, if it's OK with um, our staff members that we move into the strategic plan and then come back to book nook and texting since we have guests waiting for that conversation. Does that make sense to you, Dr. Felder to do it that way or would you like to? Power through book notes. Sure. And yep, I think that's okay. a great idea. Let's do it. So we'll move into strate the strategic plan and then we'll circle back to book nook and texting. All right. All right. So if we can advance to, I think it's slide 40 or thereabout. And while we're waiting for that, I'll just jump in. So as stated uh, previously at previous board meetings, our strategic plan will be our North Star and our roadmap. It will articulate uh, Orange County Schools goal, mission, vision, belief, uh, and strategies for how we will achieve our objective and how we'll measure our progress. We believe in not just setting goals, but tracking our success with important metrics. Through this strategic plan, we'll keep our team accountable as we strive towards greatness for our students. Our goal is for this plan to represent everyone in the community. We're engaging our families, our staff, and students to get their input throughout the process. Next slide, please. So uh, the strategic planning process. So to date, and uh, with stakeholder input, we've drafted a belief statement, mission, and vision statement. Uh, most recently, stakeholders had another opportunity to offer input on our draft uh, goals. Uh, but before we get to that, and uh, uh, we want to quickly update you on how we gathered input from the community to date. So prior to COVID, uh, we held several listen and learn sessions for our families and staff to provide feedback to us on areas uh, where we could improve. We use that feedback to develop four priority priority areas, um, uh, and those four priorities remain uh, a focus on equity, uh, literacy, climate, culture, and social emotional learning and family engagement. So as noted in step one, we drafted and got feedback on the belief, mission, and vision statements from stakeholders, including the board. Next, as noted in step two, uh, four goals were drafted and staff uh, stakeholder feedback provided was provided by an online portal and feedback sessions. Tonight, the board will have an opportunity to provide feedback on the four draft goals. Once we receive feedback on our four draft goals, we will create goal teams uh, to draft the work that we need to do to achieve the goals and measure our success, which is noted in step three. Next slide, please. So just to recap, uh, this is our draft vision, preparing every learner for lifelong service and success. Next slide, our draft mission uh, is to engage, challenge, and inspire, educating students in a safe, inclusive environment where we engage, challenge, and inspire them to reach their maximum potential. Next slide, please. Uh, draft a belief statement. So these are, uh, here they are. Uh, these are the core values for all employees of Orange County Schools, regardless of our titles and job descriptions. These are the beliefs that guide all of our decisions and the choices we make in our respective positions to support our vision and mission. We value diversity. We put students first. We pursue excellence in all we do. We prioritize equity. We provide a safe environment. We serve the whole child. An inclusive culture and climate starts with us. We are accountable. 
we collaborate to do great work. It's important to note that the whole child approach moves us beyond just focusing on academic achievement and recognizes the need to educate the whole child, including the social emotional learning side of the child. The five tenets are healthy, safe, engaged, supported, and challenged. Next slide, please. The next step in our strategic planning process uh, and this evening's update for the board and stakeholders is a presentation of our four draft goals. Our goals are statements of what we are trying and planning to achieve in, in order to work towards our vision of preparing every Orange County Schools learner for a lifelong service and success. Next slide, please. So, and before, so before uh, the team provides you uh, with our, or presents our four draft goals, I want to assure you that our four priorities um, were reviewed as a part of this process. Our four priorities were developed, again, based on feedback received from stakeholders and data uh, reviewed as part of my entry plan in the late uh, 2019, early 2020. Uh, these priorities were also developed to ensure we had a focus while we were updating our strategic plan. Uh, these four priorities are embedded in our four draft goals and will continue to guide our work moving forward as we develop objectives to support our goals. Next slide. So before the team shares the four draft goals, I know, <laughs> anticipation, we're going to get there. I want to update you on the process uh, that was used for soliciting feedback from stakeholders. Uh, during uh, April, members of Extended Cabinet reviewed qualitative and quantitative feedback received thus far regarding our strategic plan and worked with the North Carolina School Boards Association to develop supporting goals. Uh, in May, we shared the four draft goals with uh, families, staff, and uh, the community for their feedback. We developed a special page on our website in addition to a short video developed by staff to highlight the strategic planning process to date. We also developed um, a form for stakeholder feedback, which was shared with all staff and families to solicit their input uh, regarding our four goals. The form was anonymous and we asked individuals to rank each goal. Um, approximately, uh, 100 stakeholders responded to our online form seeking feedback regarding the four goals, and uh, they were asked to rate each goal on a scale of one to five, with four and five being important. Next slide. Again, the form was anonymous, and we asked individuals to rank each goal from one to five, with one as not important and five as very important. Here's one example. Uh, we also provide definitions for terms that we felt were important to understand and primarily uh, uh, terms that are used by edu educators. So uh, we wanted to ensure clarity there. So again, um, we did get approximately 100 uh, responses. Uh, then uh, next slide, please. And so I'd uh, like to quickly highlight what members of our team are going to share with you first. Uh, we will include the percentage of stakeholders who ranked the importance of the goal as either uh, a four or five out of the one through five scale. In addition to the goal, we have an equity emphasis for each goal. Uh, this is important because equity is not a standalone goal. Equity is part of everything we do. Uh, so this also allows us to focus on identified inequities. And in some instances, uh, we will be further reviewing and identifying uh, inequities to ensure we meet the needs of all students while making uh, gains in closing the uh, uh, gaps, opportunity gaps, achievement gaps, access gaps. And as previously mentioned, we will continue to provide a definition of terms that are primarily used by educators as we continue this process and ultimately have our strategic plan posted online and in hard copy. So without further ado, uh, our team will share our four goals, starting with teaching tomorrow's learners. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Chris, Connie, and Jason, not sure. Uh, who's taking the lead, but 
I'm sure they know who's taking the lead. So take it away. Good evening. Yes, I'm going to take it away. I am so pleased to be able to present draft goal number one, teaching tomorrow's leaders. As you can see, 96% of people who um, completed the survey ranked this goal as important. And so teaching tomorrow's leaders through a multi-tiered system of support, all learners will excel by having access to and benefiting from rig rigorous curriculum and instruction that is researched and evidence-based to prepare them for college, career, and civic engagement. And the equity emphasis for this goal is to identify and address inequities in curriculum and instructional practices in order to close the achievement, access, and opportunity gaps. Oh, and I will now turn it over um, for goal number two. Good evening. I will be um, going over draft goal number two, excellence in efficiency. 95% of the um, individuals polled rank this goal as important. Excellence and efficiency. The district will provide exemplary operational support to schools, staff, and community to ensure a focus on student learning. The equity emphasis ensure equitable distribution of human, physical, and capital resources across Orange County schools. And instead of making equity a single goal, we decided to include it um, an equity emphasis with each draft goal. Thank you. And I will be turning it over to Teresa and Connie. Okay. Um, good evening. I'll present draft goal three, exemplary staff. 92% of our stakeholders ranked this goal as important. Exemplary staff recruit, hire, support, and retain culturally proficient and high quality staff committed to providing all students with an excellent education. The equity emphasis for goal number three is to hire and retain staff that reflects the diversity of the district and mirrors the demographics of the OCS student population and who are committed to becoming culturally proficient. And we provided a definition of culturally proficient teacher and um, this particular definition and the work from um, Lindsay Robbins and Terrell, um, we are actually uh, providing training to our principals um, in alignment with um, the cultural proficient uh, leader manual. Good evening, draft goal four, empowering culture. We will cultivate supportive partnerships among families, schools, and community stakeholders to support students' well being and ensure all students have what they need to be successful. As our equity emphasis, we will identify and remove barriers and engage in culturally responsive practices that strengthen connections and communication with families, students, and the community. And now it's your time to provide any feedback uh, to us that you may have. And um, thank you so much, Ms. Stone. And just before the board does, I do wanna introduce our guests uh, because they're uh, here to uh, help weigh in, chime in, and uh, particularly around the process. And so we have joining us uh, Ms. Leanne Winner, who is the Executive Director for the North Carolina School Board Association. And joining her uh, is Ms. Nancy Black, who is the Staff Attorney for the North Carolina uh, School Board Association. So Orange County uh, Schools is extremely uh, fortunate to be able to work with not one of them, but both of them. And uh, they are guiding us through this process, something they've done numerous times with many other school districts in North Carolina. And uh, we are, again, very grateful um, to have their support and uh, guiding us through this important process. So, uh, Ms. Winner and Ms. Black, uh, feel free to chime in along the way. Thank you all so much for being here, and I promise we'll get you on the agenda first next time. <laughs> Sorry, you've been waiting around. Okay. Thank you. It's good to be here.
So I number? think I think where we are right now is um, we want to get your feedback on these four goals. Um, and we will take that back at our next meeting tomorrow um, and, and see what adjustments need to be made. So, Madam Chair, um, I'll give it back to you to, to open the floor for um, any board comments on the um, four goals. Thank you. Ms. Smiley, I saw your hand up. Um, thanks. Um, uh, so, I really like, um, I know that these are going to eventually be tied to measurable outcomes. And so I think of goals as like the numeric part. So this is it's it was a reframing of that for me, but <laughs> this was helpful. It was helpful to see these outcomes defined in really um, clear um, statements where I could really sort of picture what the outcome, what that would look like that outcome. Um, I um, really like the way that you phrased the first one. Um, all learners will excel. Um, college career and civic engagement, rigorous, you know, I, I really liked all of that. Um, there was a definition underneath about culturally relevant curriculum, maybe culturally sustaining curriculum, something like that, that I'm not sure I might have missed where it was above, um, but I, 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 I think that that's something that's important. So, um, uh, I love that you put the definitions. <laughs> love that. Um, and these four areas seem really strong to me and um, I had a question about I just think there's an opportunity the phrase high quality staff um, in the third one I think that there's just an opportunity maybe to describe more what that means um, and I guess I'm having a little bit of a reaction to like I just don't think that people always fall into like high quality you're high quality you're not high quality you know I think it's it's a little bit situational as well. And so um, I think there might be a little bit of opportunity for wordsmithing there, but like to the overall sentiment of that goal. That's it. Thank you. Ms. Um, Ms. Hauser. Um, thank you. I, I actually like the goals. I thought it got to the real foundational issues that we're dealing with in the district. And so thank you for that. I, ha I have a few suggestions on wording and I wondered if it was and I'll go take you through them and I wondered if it was possible for the teams that are going to work on the goals to add illustrative metrics so to just start their thinking directionally on the kinds of things you'd like to see measured on it and I'll give you some examples so um, goal one I thought it was great I would have used the word I love the word rigorous I prefer the word challenging or innovative because some of our curriculum like um i think our you know i'm not sure rigor is the right term so some of like our cte curriculum I'm not sure rigor is the word to describe that i think it's really innovative and and, and inspiring um is more of what but anyway you, you, that's not that's second to me but but that goal one is the is the one where I think we're going to be looking at student growth and achievement and disparities by group. Um, I also wondered about as access to social emotional learning re resources, if that would be something that would be. Those are just examples of the kind of metrics I'd expect to see there. District on on uh, goal two. Our district works with our community, but our operations do not serve the community. So I think they've got to change that wording a little bit. Um, and on those metrics, that's about service levels, right? It's like, do the buses show up on time? Do the buildings work? You know, there, we have we have zero tolerance on building outages. How's the food, right? That's the kind of metrics I would see there. Um, goal three, pretty straightforward. Um, I agree with Sarah's comment on on what's high quality, um, and you know that's where we see all the not only the questions about our staff demographics, but what about in terms of retention? Um, how, um, how, how are we doing on retention? How long does it take us to hire people? What is the level of use of subs in our building? Um, and then there's this thing called staff growth. How do we grow people in the organization? But the goal I had the most trouble with was goal four. And it's not that I don't like the goal, I just don't know how to measure it. 
And I wondered if goal four um, belongs as part of goal one. So it's just a thought about should it should it um, be put in to goal one. That was that was just again. I just have no idea how you measure it. So, but thank you. I think it's great. Ms. Doyle. I really appreciate all the work that went into this and I like how it's um, kind of getting narrower and more measurable um, kind of as Sarah was mentioning. I, I like that it's four and that that you all surveyed um, the importance from people. Um, and I like that the equity sort of measure for each goal is described, um, for example, with number three, um, we know that we're roughly 50% of color in our district, and it's hard for many districts to get above 20% um, educators of color. And so I like the um, the wording that as we are likely to struggle to have our um, educator diversity really mirror our student population, becoming culturally proficient um, is super important. And, um, you know, one area where we've looked at that a number of times is with our in within our AIG program um, and wanting wanting that to reflect our diversity of students and wanting um, instructors to reflect the diversity of students and how important it is for, for our all of our instructors, but for example, our AIG in, instructors to become culturally proficient. So I like that that language is in there. Um, and I guess I do have a question with the inequities in curriculum in number one, is that referring to um, what's in the curriculum or student access to curriculum? That would be one particular question, but I really appreciate how this has um, kind of gone through a funnel effect to prioritize what's important and then work towards measurable um, outcomes. Thank you, Ms. Doyle. Other board members? Mr. Atherton? So I, I won't repeat everybody else's comments that I already made, but on goal three, um, one of the things to me is uh, talking about recruiting, hiring, supporting, retaining culturally proficient and high quality staff committed to inspiring, welcoming, and engaging all students with excellent education. I mean, as I, those three words come to my mind as I think about teachers and when we've had to listen and learn, welcoming was probably the number one thing that people brought up. Students talking about being inspired and then engaging all students, I think is important. And that, that draft goal as we're looking at uh, retaining, hiring, and supporting the teachers, uh, that would be the, the feedback I give that hasn't already been covered by others because I think the next step of the measurements is really important. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I, I too am generally very supportive of these. Um, I, I think most of my comments have already been covered, so I will just leave it at that, but I think that um, it's exciting to see this coming together. Great. Well, thank you all for your feedback. Uh, and so at this time, we just want to brief you on next steps. And so, um, Ms. Winner and Ms. Black, um, if you can uh, speak uh, to that, I will kick off with. Uh, so on May 24th, uh, we would like to bring back, oh, that's today. Yeah. <laughs> so today, uh, the board approves um, the vision, mission, and belief statements and goals. So, well, actually, it's the collective feedback. It's not an approval yet. And, uh, and so just know May through uh, July, uh, we solicit stakeholder involvement through the four goal teams, the teams, and these teams will consist of uh, parents and staff and uh, students, uh, members of the community, um, school-based uh, staff uh, in, in all categories, as well as a central office. They can be as large as 14, 15, 16, uh, and so they will have a chair and a co-chair, um, but uh, their goal will be to, or charge, 
uh, would be to develop again objectives, action steps, and measures of success, and a timeline uh, to present to um, uh, to the uh, leadership, and then we will bring that back to the board. So, Leanne and uh, Nancy, anything else to add with regards to next steps? Um, so, just a couple of other things, real quickly. Um, we expect that this will take about 12 weeks um, to work through this. Um, we're thinking about six weeks for the objectives and about six weeks for the action steps and measurables. Um, with it being summertime, um, we actually have already added in a little extra time. Normally we would do objectives in a month and then the action steps and measurables in a month. Um, but we've given a little extra time just because summer is a little more challenging time as, as people take vacations and, and scatter and just need a little time to, to um, for their own mental health. Um, so hopefully that 12 weeks will work. We may need to add a couple more um, if at the end if we need to. Um, at some point in this process, um, we may wait till the very end or we may do it after the objectives. We will bring back to you for your approval the um, vision, mission, belief statements, and goals. And that's what we will be asking you to approve. Um, we will not ask you to approve the objectives, action steps, and measurables because this is supposed to be a living, breathing plan um, for five years. And those things are likely to change as you move through the plan through the years and you and the the staff needs to be able to work with it. Um, if they didn't meet a measurable one year, um, let's say something was supposed to, the target was 45%, they came in at 43%, um, they need to be able to go in and adjust the, the subsequent years and the measurables so that they um, are not um, trying to achieve too much in any given year. Um, so that is why we typically only have the board approved through the goal area because the rest of it is are things that should um, change through the five years. Um, or you may exceed your number. Um, didn't want to necessarily just put one that was in a negative. Um, you may you know, knock it way out of the park one year and you have already achieved your number for the subsequent year. So you need to go ahead and go in and be able to make um, some of those changes. Um, so that is what we will be working on for the next um, three months or so. Thank you so much. Um, I saw Ms. Hauser and then Ms. Smiley. Just for clarity, when when we get the goals, it will have the metrics or the measures that will be used in it. But I think I'm hearing you say it won't have the actual values or the actual numbers that are going to be in it. But we will know the measurements that the district intends to use to measure success. Is that correct? Um, it depends on how far they've gotten by the time um, we bring it back to you. Um, and I will just tell you, you know, at least one other district that we have worked with, um, some of those numbers were really not solidified um, even within a couple months of the whole plan being put together. They were still trying to figure out what that target should be. Um, so I don't want to put your staff in a position that they're picking numbers that um, they're not likely to achieve or succeed with. Um, that they they are realistic goals um, and that they have some meaning behind them. And if it need, it, I, I hope that you will afford them, you know, a little bit more of the time um, to make sure that they get that number as close to what they think is right as possible. Understood. That was my question was, will you tell us what actual um measurements we'll be using without telling us the actual numbers or the specific numeric what, goals that we said, but will you be telling us what the metrics are? If you want us to wait until that point, we can. That would mean that we would not bring it back for approval to, we would not bring it back to you for approval until probably right when school is starting. 
Um, well, I mean, I'd love to see it in the interim as well, just putting that out there. But my question was actually really related to Ms. Hauser, so I'll just, or it wasn't a question, it was just a statement. Um, I, I would find it really helpful as an outcome here to, um, to have, have very clear, and I think we'll have this, what are the enduring sort of things we measure and keep an eye on that are our compass for how we are succeeding or not as a district um, and what kind of progress we're making. So even if the particular numbers year to year or the which of the priorities we're like really dialing in on, even though those things change, what are those most important measures? Um, understanding what those categories of things I think was part of what Ms. Hauser was saying is and and that I just wanted to agree with. I think that that would be really important. What's what sort of our enduring measures of success? And I will just say some measures are much easier to identify than other measures. Um, when you start talking about things like community engagement, um, those are a little bit harder to identify um, how you're going to measure that. And, and that just takes a little bit more thought and, you know, do, do they exist? Um, do you need to create something? Um, and what exactly is it that you're going to measure again? Um, so that so, some of them are a little bit easier to find than others. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Any final thoughts? Okay, well, we will look forward to seeing you all again soon. Yes, um, thank you for having us again and we will we will see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. So now we will circle back to book nook and texting before we move into first reading of new policies. Um, Dr. Felder, how long do you think that we need for those three items? Because uh, we have nine minutes left. Oh, sure. well, I do think we'll need more than nine minutes. Um, so, yeah, I yeah, I don't think we can get all this in in, in nine nine minutes. Um, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes. So maybe if we extended by 15, we have 25 minutes. Do you think that's a realistic uh, we, window? We will do our best. We, we, we will do our best. Mm -hmm. Let's give it a whirl. Um, I, heard, I heard Will trying to um, get your attention. So oh, I'm sorry. maybe louder yes. on my microphone. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, the only question I have is, uh, uh, the Orange County School Summer Scholars Academy, we haven't covered either. So that was first on the agenda. Oh, goodness. You're right. You are right. I... Thank you. Um, okay, so we probably need to extend by half an hour. Um, do I have a motion to extend until 10 o'clock? Moved. Second. I have a motion from Mr. Atherton, a second from Ms. Hauser. I vote yes, Ms. Moore. Yes. Ms. Smiley? Yes. Ms. Stevens? Yes. Mr. Atherton? Yes. Ms. Doyle? Yep. Yes. Ms. Hauser? Yes. Ms. Hauser? Yes. Okay, so we have until 10 now. And thank you, Mr. Atherton, for catching that. <laughs> No Above it was on OCS Online Academy, and for some reason, my I just saw OCS Academy again and just blanked right over it. So let's start there. Summer Scholars. And that and that will be my item. Um, yeah. Good evening again. As you know, House Bill 82 is requiring school districts to offer the in-person summer program this summer. Um, on this slide, you will find the general logistics of our Orange County Schools Summer Scholar Academy. This is a, a slide that you guys have seen previously, that the board has seen previously. It has a focus around remediation, readiness, and enrichment with SEL and PE. It's a six-week program with beginning June 14th and ending July 30th, with a gap in between for holiday break from July 5th through the 9th. Um, the program will be all day from 8 to 5, Monday through Thursday. Um, there will be an extension to 6 o'clock for parents that are not able to pick their kids up at 5 o'clock. Uh, transportation and meals will be provided. And we will also be offering child care on Fridays for our K-8 students. You also see on this slide a, a schedule that the K-8 students will be using. 
Um, please note the high schools will have a focus on credit recovery because of graduation requirements and their schedules will slightly be different than the K-8 schools. Just as a side note, credit recovery allows a student to retake some standards from a class that they have not mastered. Once students have completed those standards and have demonstrated mastery, then their grade for the class would then become a P for pass, and they would then be granted credit for the course. High schools will also work with students who have passed the course, but they would like to have a little bit more enrichment or just a, a deeper understanding of that particular course so they will feel comfortable as they move on to the next course. With that said, there will be some enrichment opportunities for our high school students. CTE will be offering skills camps. Also, a few CTE teachers will be offering labs. We will offer SWIFT programming, and some of our high school students will be working the K-8 Summer Scholars as well. Next slide, please. On this slide, you will see staff pay. We have increased certified staff salary to be competitive with surrounding districts. Certified staff salary has gone from $30 to $40. Staffing numbers are pretty much the same as when we reported at the last board meeting. We contacted staff this past Friday, letting them know that they were selected to work summer scholars. By contacting staff this past Friday, it also is helping us in our planning because staff now is informing us whether or not they're still interested in working this summer and if they want to change their work hours or work weeks that they work. I'm happy to say that most of the staff still want to work and we even have a few staff members that want to extend the amount of time they're working over the summer. Our work this week will be around creating student rosters and placing staff at different school locations and assigning their teacher assignments for summer scholars. Principals and school staff will give us feedback on our student rosters that we're creating just to help us ensure that we have the right students in the right classes. Next slide, please. Our locations um, for our elementary schools are New Hope Elementary, Grady A. Brown Elementary, and Pathways Elementary. For our middle school, it will be Gravelly Hill Middle School, and we're using all three of our high schools. These locations were chosen based on availability for the summer. And, and they do not have major work going on in their buildings. Next slide, please. So we have 1,386 students signed up for Summer Scholars. On this slide, you will see how many students are signed up by school. Please note that the high schools have a separate sign up, sign up that the school administrators and counselors are keeping up with. So their student numbers are higher than what, what they appear to be on this slide. For our elementary schools, note that Cameron Park, Eflin Cheeks, and New Hope are well over, two, well, they're over 200 students with Eflin Cheeks at 200. We are still going through our students' data, and in this week's board weekly update, we will update you around student demographics and the breakdown of how many students by grade level. I will tell you from looking at the preliminary data, of the 1,300 students, 20% are African American. 32% are Hispanic and 36% are white. At this time, I will pause for any questions and comments. Ms. Hauser? A um, couple. First, I wanted to thank you, and I also wanted to uh, shout out to the schools because I know how hard people have worked to reach out to families to get them to sign up, and these numbers are, are really encouraging. So thank you for that. Um, just have a, you know, it's hard to tell from the teachers. You said you're working on the rosters. Is the gut that we have enough teachers? It's hard, you know, I, I can't connect these dots. And do we need to? A lot of the schools are offering bonuses, not just salaries. I just didn't know if we need to um, do more. And um, and when you give us a demographic, could you give us a sense of are we reaching the students that have the greatest need? You know, and do we need to do so it's separate from some, but in addition to summer school, do we need to think about other ways to reach students? So, but I think this is where we're on the right track. This is very encouraging. Thank you. And yes, when I give the board weekly update this week, we can give the at risk students. Mr. Atherton. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, very good update. I'm very pleased as well to see the numbers going up. One of the questions I had was on the staffing breakdown. Um, I know it's by the different schools, um, but will we have social workers and counselors and nurses at each of the schools? Uh, have we at least uh, acquired, you know, that type of staff? I'm, I can't tell from how you have it laid out because it's, you know, just kind of generic, but I mean, those are really critical things for our schools, especially for our any of our families, right? Yes, so Mr. Atherton, um, there will be at six of the seven sites full time um, counselor, social worker, and nurse at um, partnership just because of size and the um, number of students, they will have served those services, but that will be shared and um, provided um, from another school. So yes, all of those positions are there. And the, as far as like, please know that as we are working on the rosters, especially in our K through three, um, Ms. Wilson, who's overseeing our Read to Achieve or RTA program, is doing all of the intricate work in analyzing the data and determining, you know, that the students are in the right um, groups and cohorts that need to be to really address their literacy needs. And so we definitely, like Mr. Johnson said, will be providing the um, breakdown and the numbers of at-risk students. and not only K through three, but also uh, four through 12, and majority of our students um, at the high school will be um, our students that are needing additional um, credit recovery support. And as we know that our students, you know, while we have some preliminary numbers, we're waiting on to see how our students do the second semester before they can finalize those numbers. The one thing that I do want to say here on this particular chart, you'll see rising K has four students. That is not including the FSA pre-K, uh, the Family um, Success Alliance, their uh, rising K program numbers. So this should be, I think Mr. Johnson, is that about 20, 24 oh, four students? No, I think that I want to say it's 40. Okay, so, so there are, additional students because they are you know housed on like we are integrating that partnership and program under this umbrella of OCS summer scholars so um those numbers are not included in this but and that's why you know once we get the full final count we will again provide you that um, update as we continue to work out the details of our programming Okay, the, the other question I have in the same vein of staffing is we're, we're gonna have the schools open in the hottest part of the summer. Are we gonna have enough maintenance staff to be on, on call if we have an issue with any of our air or, you know, I'm not sure, I personally don't know if maintenance is 10 or 12 months or how their contract is or over summer or not. So uh, we do, we will, of course, have custodial staff um, online at the schools, but our maintenance team, they'll be available and they have been, um, they did attend a couple of our planning sessions. So they are aware of, of which buildings they helped us to identify which buildings would be the best um, for this. And they will be there to support should we need additional support with our um, air conditioning. Excellent. Last question I have is technology. Um, are we picking up laptops this year and at the end of the school or are kids keeping it through the summer uh, and then will they need the laptops for actual in-person school? So I believe uh, Mr. Jones is on the call, but I do not believe we are planning on picking, uh, collecting the devices, especially when majority of like all of our students for summer Scholars will need their devices, um, especially in the morning when they are doing their personalized um, academic programming online. In the afternoon, majority of that will not require on their uh, devices, but we will um, 
have the you know keep having to keep their devices for the morning work. The afternoon work entails a lot of um, hands-on activities and um, project-based inquiry exploration type of learning. So, um, but there are some programs that they will need their devices. So, I do I do not believe we're collecting them. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other board members. All right. Thank you so much. We thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. To Book Nook. Dr. Gammon. Good evening. Um, due to, to time constraints this evening, um, a couple of things that I wanted to ask. I, I did provide in Friday's uh, board weekly update um, all of the, the talking points that I'm going to share this evening. Um, so I, I wanted to ask this evening if there are specific questions or topics that you'd like for me to address um, just to help with time. I think that's a great idea. Mr. Atherton? So, so first, Dr. Gammon, I just wanted to say thank you for all you're doing to help the families and students. I've seen where you have been able to solve problems really quickly by connecting the families in Book Nook and making sure they're getting addressed. And, you know, even some that have been, you know, five times they weren't able to get on that all of a sudden those were resolved. So I just wanted to stop and just say thank you for all you're doing to help with this. Um, one of the questions I, I have is, you know, how do we, you know, we, we have the students who are in the program and, you know, some of their reading levels are higher than what the teachers are saying. And, you know, so they're teaching or tutoring at a higher level than maybe the teachers are. So how do we reconcile, you know, these differences uh, between the two? I, I do realize that no matter who does the testing, there will always be some deltas, right? That, hey, I'm, I'm testing this person. I think they're a level higher or lower. But as, you know, as we're going between school and book nook, how do we ensure, you know, we're, we're all set to the same goal at the end of the day? Yeah, so th that's a, a great question. Um, a couple of, of pieces that we've really worked through since the initial rollout. Um, you know, this year, due to COVID, we were limited with some of the, the traditional data sources, whether it's integrated assessments or kind of quarterly benchmarks that we typically give. And we didn't have those pieces in place when we were starting the program. Um, so when we did kind of our January 2021 pool um, of data from that time, uh, BookNote did use M class and exact path um, at the K3 level. Um, and then use exact path data at the 4-8 level to, to help set kids um, in their kind of level sets with their groupings. Um, one thing that we have consistently communicated to BookNook um, and, and through conversations with families has been that there are um, large numbers of students that have been placed correctly and seem to be in the right space, but then there are groups, groupings of students or individual students that may not be. Um, so what we've requested and BookNook ha has been very helpful in sharing with us the current levels that they have students, um, those have now been pushed to schools um, so that schools can actually go through and really do a thorough cross check of what that level is compared to what classroom teachers um, or, or building level leaders are seeing with those individual students just to make sure that we kind of dotted all I's and cross T's. Um, and so when th this coming week, there's gonna be an additional level set, which means students within this first phase will be regrouped. Um, and, and at this point, not only will they be regrouped based off of that data that was originally used, but also off of this more qualitative data um, that we're getting from schools to, to kind of help inform that. That is fantastic to hear. I, I thank you so much. This has been one of those that you know, been worried about teachers and students, and th this sounds like a fantastic approach and making sure everybody's aware, and it gives the teachers a chance to know who's in Book Nook and who's not as well. Um, the the other question I had, and then I'll let any other board member, I'll uh, step back. The question I have is, I, I you know, I'm aware that Book Nook is sending out surveys to our, our parents are we doing any surveys to say, you know, something like, uh, 
how's your experience been with Booknook? Are you currently having issues? Um, are you still using it? Suggestions, something on our side. Um, I know some of the parents have told me that, you know, uh, if they've had a bad experience with Booknook, they're just not talking to them, right? And on our side, I think if we can learn anything to help these parents or families uh, to engage, because uh, I, I, I know I've said it every time I've talked about it, I do think it's a good program. I think we just have some rough edges that we're trying to get through for whatever reason. Um, are, are there any plans on our side to pull our families to to see their experience from the district's perspective? So, yeah, a, a couple of things with that, and, and I do want to be clear that as far as surveys that have been administered up to this point, um, we have actively worked with Booknook to co-create those surveys. Um, so, so questions that are, are oftentimes populated in the surveys that are sent out are actually our OCS team is, is um, devising those questions. Booknook has that direct mode of access through text to families where they're able to send the surveys out. Um, so it is a co-created um, survey. However, um, we're very much aware, just as you noted, Mr. Atherton, that there may not be the same level of response. And so, for example, one of the recent surveys that we shared was a, a short two question survey trying to gauge how, how the program is going, but also trying to learn from families that may have disconnected at some point the why behind that. And we did not get as many responses. And so knowing that um, a next step for us, and, and I had it listed in my uh, talking points for this evening, is um, for us to work with our communications team um, to potentially develop a, a user friendly survey that we, we can just post on our website. Um, because we now, as you can see on the slide that's posted, there are a lot of things that are now really forward facing for families on the OCS website, where if they go to that frequently asked questions help page, um, they would have an option there at any point in time just to, to submit responses or feedback um, so that we can kind of keep a pulse from families directly on how things are going. That's great to hear because I, I do believe a lot of people ignored the surveys or at least what I was hearing was everybody believed it's just from Booknook and said, you know, not doing it. But I, I think the website is a great step as well. Again, I'll just say thank you for all your support of our students and families on this. I think this turning it around to such a great success has been by your leadership. Thank you. Um, Ms. Hazard and Ms. Smiley. So uh, a couple of questions. I, I want to echo. I'm like really excited that this has gone out to the schools to get the leveling right. And that's going to, I hope that will help. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the numbers. Are we at our last report? I think we started close to or had an expectation of 500. We were down to about 230. Do you know how many students are actually participating at this point? And then the second question is, could we move away from surveys? I think surveys are, you know, could we just get a direct report every day or every week of how many students participated with, and whether they were taught by a sub or by um, their tutor and just get, get a report and then we just track it and see how it goes. Because of the point you made, Dr. Gammon, that people, aren't showing up and a lot of our parents are not going to respond. The surveys are, it, it just adds more work. And what we really want to know is who's showing up. And if they're not showing up, we need to move in and fix it. So is there a way we can move into a more active kind of diagnostic process rather than surveys? Yes, yeah, so those are, are great questions that, that we've really um, had a lot of deliberation around, especially with Booknook, a couple of things. Um, from their end is they do provide and they have consistently provided a weekly report um, that does does provide us those exact numbers uh, for the three sessions that happen per week. Um, you know, the amount of kids that should have have attended sessions, the amount that actually did, um, as well as the amount that attempted to and maybe there was a, an issue with the tutor. Um, those things are laid out um, pretty clearly from them so we can keep that weekly pulse on what's going on. Um, one of the the pieces that we did note in our most recent communication with Booknook is that it, it's really going to be imperative that they are supportive of direct communication with families, um, supportive of our team in that space, especially for uh, the, the chunks of students that we can see in the numbers that, that aren't 
um, attending or they, they maybe at some point there's been a disconnect. We, we realize that surveys aren't always the best method. Um, it will be more timely to do this, but BookNook uh, you know, has assured us that they would be a part of the process of direct outreach to families so that they can communicate um, actual you know, verbal conversation about the why behind um, you know, rationale of why they're not on or why they maybe have missed some sessions. So they're gonna be very helpful in that regard, but it will take more time um, than a survey would. My Other best. thoughts from uh, oh yeah um, thanks um yeah um my um I echo the thanks for all of the hard work um there's been a lot a lot of progress um the only comment that I had was around um when we are ready to evaluate the effectiveness of book nook sort of as a whole obviously there's a lot of logistical things we've been working out um but in terms of as an effective literacy tutoring mechanism. Um, it just seems to me that that analysis will need to be fairly complicated and not a simple report from BookNook about how many students have grown so many levels. So when students were off in the first place and then it got corrected, like that's one thing that comes into play. If you combine the students who really didn't come with the students who came to every session, uh, you're going to weaken the effect. So it, it does seem like kind of a complicated analysis to really understand the effects of the program. Um, and so I just wanted to put that out there that, you know, if when we come to the point, I do want to know how this went, you know, and, and I, I imagine we will be evaluating whether to expand it, continue it next year as a strategy. And just that um, I think it will be important for us to do a pretty rigorous level of analysis that I'm not sure BookNook has always done with every partner. And so I don't know if you all have talked about what kind of data you have access to and things, but just wanted that on your radar. Sure thing, and, and we, and I'll be very brief, we have had conversations and, and you are correct that, that there are a lot of moving parts with that data for all the reasons that you mentioned. Um, one strategy for us during this kind of short-term period is this smaller group of students that just started here recently in, in kind of this second phase of phase one of that was not shared in the board weekly update. Um, that's kind of more of a, a piloted group that we can focus on if there is true everyday access in the way that we intended from day one for this group and with us having this qualitative data from teachers around with their levels it's going to be much easier to compare apples to apples of that growth trajectory for that group whereas there are going to be more complexities for that first cohort of kids as you noted um, so that's one way that we can do that as we start to assess moving forward but we're working closely with book nook um, to, to have that information so we can provide that in a future update Thank you so much, Dr. Gaiman. I echo all of the thanks as well. We really appreciate you. And we will now get a quick update on texting from Ms. Stowe. Uh, good evening, Chair McKenzie, Vice Chair Stevens, and board members. So why texting? Uh, it's important to build our family's social capital meaning their ability to navigate the relationships that research suggests will improve student outcomes. So here is a quick update per your request to help our families be better engaged with our schools and district. Um, in confirming technology trends, a new report by National School Public Relations Association shows that parents would like information to be conveniently pushed to them versus them having to seek it out. So personalization, is the expectations for emails, text messages, voice messages, direct phone calls, face to face meetings. Families want us to cut through all the noise and send them necessary impactful information. So that's why we're really excited about making the switch to Blackboard's mass notification platform. So currently we utilize Black for, uh, Blackboard for our websites and we use Blackboard for our connected messaging. We, we send emails and phone calls to our families and staff. And now we have switched. We did a soft launch in January and switched to their mass notification system. Uh, we did a soft launch in January with one of our elementary schools. And because of our continued at the time um, uncertainty with our return to school and recognizing the need to be able to communicate with all families, particularly those who were remote, we did not make a switch 
or a mandatory switch to this system because it did require training of all of our principals and district staff. Um, so we are planning to make the full switch in July 5th. Um, however, uh, we have trained principals to date and they can use either system. So they can start using this now. We just won't make the mandatory switch until July 5th. So a couple highlights about this new system. Uh, number one, we'll have the ability to text. Number two, this is going to be our principal's communication best friend because they're going to be able to send one message and check boxes. I want this on my website. I wanted a phone call. I want a text I want an email. I want it on Facebook and I want it on Twitter in one click. So all of these systems work together. Um, also, this um, will allow families to select a level of communication, as I mentioned at last week's community engagement subcommittee meeting where families can select their preferred communications methods. For example, if it's inclement weather, I want a text, an email, a phone call, and I want my mother to know because she's going to have to go home to be there for my kids when they arrive. Um, so we're going to have that ability. This summer, the communications team, um, including our family liaisons, will work with families in a variety of ways to ensure that we have all their up-to-date communication methods. This is one big part of this puzzle, is who needs to know what and how do you prefer that they know it? Um, and then most importantly, as part of this process, we are taking a look at all of our family communications at the school and the district level so that we can develop guidelines together uh, with our principals to share with our families for the upcoming school year so that they know what types of messages we send, how often we send them, and the methods of which we will send them. Um, and so while this technology will be a great tool for families who don't utilize the system, we will continue because our goal is to continue to dig deep and ensure that we're communicating with everyone. Um, so that's a quick update. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you so much, Ms. Doe. Um, unless anyone has something really burning, we've got 10 minutes to do policy. So um, is it okay with everyone for us to head on through? All right, very good. Thank you so much, Ms. Doe. And we will move into first reading of new policies. Okay. Uh, thank Welcome you, um, board. Brown. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to present to you 11 new policies. Um, these policies were shared by their experts, um, their subject area experts to the policy committee on April 23rd. The first policy that I would like to present to you um, this evening for first reading is policy 3300 school calendar and time for learning. The recommended changes to this particular policy are as follows. The policy was reorganized. The format of the policy was reorganized. Um, it removes the second paragraph that gives uh, specific um, identification to 2020-21 school year. Other changes include adding a statement to section C to address general duty clause of the Occupational Safety and Health Act of North Carolina. Other changes to policy 3300 include Hold on, I'm just include added legal references and removing outdated legal um, legal legal um, references. So adding legal references and removing outdated legal references. That's a summary of policy 3300 on first reading. The second policy for your consideration this evening is graduation requirements. Policy 3460, it updates the graduation requirements chart, which is required. It updates terminology, it updates legal references, and deletes old references. The next policy for first reading is counseling program, and that's policy 3610. Um, the recommended changes for this policy includes the following. 
It reorganizes and reformats the policy. It updates the language to better reflect the current structure and goals of the counseling program. It includes additional information about parental notification requirements. It changes the reporting requirement language to cover to cover all instances of child maltreatment that are required by law to be reported. That is a requirement. It includes other minor terminology and editorial changes. And finally, it updates legal references. For your consideration this evening, our next policy is student staff relations. That is a double policy it is policy 40. 40 and policy 7310. The required changes to this policy is that it updates the record reporting requirements in subsection C4. It updates legal references, which are required, and it also includes a revision from the previous updates, which um, we have no record that that particular um, update was filed and so we want to um, include those revisions as well for your consideration for this evening our fifth policy is homeless students and that's policy 4129 the required changes to this policy includes the following and it includes numerous revisions triggered by new language and administrative rules it updates legal references which are required and those are the two uh, requirements for homeless students policy 4129. The sixth policy for your consideration this evening for first reading for information is policy chat policy 4240 and 70 through 7312 child abuse and related threats to child safety. There are two requirements for this particular change. It updates the record reporting requirements in the last paragraph, and it updates legal requirements. The seventh policy for your consideration this evening is the criminal behavior policy, and that's policy 4335. The required changes to this particular policy, it updated language in the last sentence to reflect the language in the administrative code. That's a required change. It updates the legal citation and the text and legal references. And then uh, minor changes are just, um, it fixes some punctuality, um, punctuation uh, changes and the legal references as a recommended change. The eighth policy for consideration this evening is student health services, and that is policy 6120. The recommended changes to this particular policy, it creates a new section B to address school system mental health plan, and this is strongly recommended. It includes minor editorial changes that are recommended, and it updates legal references, which are required. Our ninth policy is administrating medications and medicines to students, which is policy 6125. It updates provisions pertaining to medication administration by school employees, access to controlled substances, and self-administration of medications by students to be consistent with the revised school health program manual, and this is strongly recommended. The other uh, revisions to this particular policy, it updates um, other resources section, which is required. And that's the two uh, changes for policy 6125, administering medications and students. Our last two policies for first reading for this evening are HR policies. The leave policy, which is 7510, it updates the temporary requirements related to COVID-19 to require adherence to state guidelines. And this is a required change. And finally, for your consideration this evening, the last policy is employee political activities, and that is policy 7720. And it clarifies language in the first paragraph expressing 
that employment or volunteer services with the school system does not preclude an individual from participating in certain political activities. That is a required change. And one strongly recommended change is adds a sentence to the last paragraph that reminds employees of the standards regarding political speech in the classroom. And those are the 11 policies for information for first reading for this evening. Are there any questions or conversation or do I have a motion to approve? I move to approve the, oh, sorry. Ms. Smiley? I know we're right at 10 o'clock. Do, do we need to extend for a couple of minutes? I do have one thing. Well, I think that we can just do it real quick. Okay, um, This ver the, the policy about political um, activities, um, I just think the phrase personal political views in the end that you're the, the in the recommendation, personal political views feels like it could be misunderstood to be all kinds of things. Um, and I think that this is intended to be about political parties, political candidates, campaigns. And so I, I wonder if we could change, consider changing that section instead of saying personal political views to something like personal preferences for political parties or candidates. Something like that. I would. I'm good with that. How does everyone else feel? I'm fine with that. So okay, thank you. I've noted that change and we'll bring that change well, back for a second let, reading. Let, um, Mr. Atherton and I understand we may need to just pull this back to policy committee and that's okay. Mr. Atherton. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm just curious how personal political views would be aligned with a political party necessarily. I, I read this to be they have a personal political view on something versus, hey, my party thinks this, right? They may say, I believe X, Y, Z, which isn't associated with any party. I, I so we have a, go ahead, sorry. No, all I was going to say is I, I don't think it's, I don't think this wording is specific to a party. I think it's that person pushing their view on somebody is what I read it as. We have a policy committee meeting on Friday. How about we just bring this policy back there and do a little wordsmithing and bring it back to the next meeting? Everybody good with that? I'm good with that. So if we will pull that particular policy, I move that we approve the other policies for the first reading tonight. Second. Thank you. So I have a motion for Ms. Stevens and a second for Ms. Smiley. Ms. Doyle, do you have something to say before we pause that? I, I was I was just gonna say that I don't think 40, 40, 73, 10 was in the agenda. And so I haven't had a chance to read it. The staff student relations. That's right. I was going to note that it's, it doesn't appear on assembly. So let's bring that one Call back for a first right. reading at the next meeting. Also, All right, let's I'll, well, I'll amend my uh, motion and I'll suggest pulling that one as well. Those as well. And I'll second that. Okay, I have a motion from Ms. Stevens and a second from Ms. Smiley. Mr. Atherton. Yes. Ms. Doyle. Yes. Ms. Hauser? Yes. I vote yes. Ms. Moore? Yes. Ms. Smiley? Yes. Ms. Stevens? Yes. All right. Well, we have approved those specific policies. We'll take the other two back to policy committee this Friday. And with that, unless Dr. Felder, do you have anything before we motion to adjourn? Great. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for your hard work this evening. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So motion to adjourn. Second. Have a, was that Ms. Smiley? Was that your motion? Who's, who motioned that? It was Carrie. Okay. Carrie. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I have a motion from Ms. Doyle, a second from Ms. Stevens. Mr. Atherton? Yes. Ms. Doyle? Yes. Ms. Hauser? Yes. I vote yes. Ms. Moore? Yes. Ms. Smiley? Yes. Ms. Stevens? Yes. We're adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.